The following program contains violence, disturbing imagery, nudity, and oh my god, why are you even watching this? Just run away. This shit is going to give you nightmares. <laughs> episode of Untold Archives and Cryptid Confessions. Here's your host, Noyce Bliskin. Hey now, how are you? This is Knife, and welcome to episode 19 of Untold Archives. This evening's episode is a rebroadcast from World Bigfoot Radio, and I want to thank them. This is an un- amazing story. I had to get it out there, so, uh, they originally aired it in three different parts, um, I went ahead and combined it all into one. I know it's a little bit lengthy, but trust me, it's worth it. You won't have to stumble around looking for parts two and three anymore, wondering if they're even out there, and you know, you, you know it's just one big deal. So, um, It's one of these lengthy stories, but you may end up pausing it a few times, but I'm sure a lot of you will end up sitting through the whole thing. And if you're one of these guys that loves to give me a hard time about my audio, then leave now, because it's got a couple of, thump, couple of bumps there in the audio, and um, there's a few glitches here and there. The dude has a little bit of a study, stutter, but trust me, it's well worth listening to. Honest to God, it's worth its weight in gold. This story is amazing. It's true. You know, um, put, if you can put up with the audio for the maybe the first ten minutes is the only bad part, and then it gets a lot better, and then the other parts two and three are like perfect. So, I promise you, it'll only be a minute or two of uh, suffering with the, the shitty audio. Now, this cat Kevin's got, a, like I said, a little bit of a stutter but a wealth of information to boot. He's kept this story under his hat for 30 years for fear of being ridiculed and turned into the town drunk. And what I mean by that is something you'll learn here in a minute. Now, without further ado, I proudly present to you the crown jewel of Sasquatch Encounters. Enjoy. I'm lucky enough to have uh, with me someone who had an experience with a younger Sasquatch and interacted with them uh, quite a few times until uh, they weren't uh, around each other anymore. But I'll let him tell you this whole story. And uh, so let me welcome onto the show Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hey, how you doing, Duke? Doing good, buddy. You good? Yeah, I'm glad I had a chance to talk to you about this and um, that you contacted me and um, you know, also really glad that you're willing to come on the show and talk about this because this is the kind of story that most people just will absolutely not share. Um, yeah, because well, you know, most most people don't believe there even is Bigfoot, much less that somebody could actually interact with one. Well, you know, uh, like I told you, it took me over 30 years to even tell anybody about any of this, and you know, it's so happy that finally heard some of your guests and it's like holy cow I'm not the only one you know at least when they think that I'm lying through my teeth or I'm insane <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to be in good company it seems like because I'm not the only one but I was I couldn't tell anybody because who's going to you know it sounds so outrageous but right. now it doesn't you know and well, b- because we hearing other people further. Yeah, before we go on any further with your with your account and your encounters, um, uh, one thing that you brought up that really fascinated me was that you had just listened to the show with Cat not very long ago, and that a bunch of the words that she was giving for their language were the same thing that you had heard your Sasquatch say, although it sounds like you had a little bit different accent. Can you tell us about that again? Yeah, well, some of the words that she said, it, well, it's like us, you know, you know, somebody from back east, like New York, you know, mm-hmm. if they 
they talk like their nose is stuck up in the air, you know, hey, how you doing? And then somebody from Texas has that southern goal. I think that they are the same way. And he, you know, the words I, that she was saying, I recognized. It's just they sounded a little different. And I think it's just like us with a regional dialect or, you know. An accent. But, yeah, regional accent. That's what I meant. Yep. Yeah, it would not surprise me at all. Is you know what does surprise me is it seems like they're using the same language all over the place. Now your your whole experience has uh, happened right over next door here in Idaho. That's the state right next to where I am. If you guys aren't quite aware of where the new broadcast from, I'm in Montana, uh, and Idaho is right next door to us. And it's the land of spuds and lots of mountains and wilderness and um, lots of animals and Bigfoot and some crabby ones. And if yeah, you guys and, remember, and, uh, you know, if you ever heard the story from the uh, the wilderness hunter that Teddy Roosevelt uh, was talking about, that one happened over there in Idaho. Yeah, so, uh, largest primitive area in the country. And there you go. No, no roads, no motorized vehicles. You got to get back there. You can take a jet boat or a small plane or helicopter, but no motorized vehicles on the ground, horse or foot, or mule, but. The whole center section of the state is all primitive area, no roads or nothing. Yeah. Yeah, the northern part of it's pretty well desolate, too. There's not a whole lot of people up there either. And a little yeah. smokestack and your old chimney up there going, pushing the smoke up toward Canada well, or whatever it is that it's doing. I think that's because Lewis and Clark were smoking too much peyote and give half our state to you, Montana. <laughs> no, that was a land grab by Montana. I actually <laughs> looked that up, and you know that was one of their stipulations for joining the union was they wanted this gigantic chunk of land that just <laughs> happened to be part of what Idaho was supposed to be, and so that's why Idaho is sort of square looking. And I told you when I was a kid, when we was up on the border, I'd go over to the Montana side and grab big rocks and bring them back to the Idaho side, making my state bigger. Things <laughs> <laughs> you know, can't think about and do. I'm going to give us more land one <laughs> at a time. Well, I can't blame Montana for doing it because, by and large, most of the really, uh, you know, I shouldn't say all of it, but most of the really nice parts of Montana are sort of in that area that they sort of grabbed from. Like, it was, yeah, the, the only the only beautiful part of Montana, you know, yeah. where you live, that should have been Idaho. Yeah, yeah, technically I would be in Idaho if it had been what they would have, were originally looking at for borders out here in the West. Yeah, it, that, instead of having that saddle, Idaho would have went straight up to Canada and Missoula and your state capital would have been in Idaho, all of that right there, Idaho would have been a big rectangle instead yeah. of a messed up frying pan. Well, what was your first experience that, uh, the first time you had any idea that there might be such a thing as Bigfoot? Oh, well, that was, yeah, I think it was my first year of hunting, and I was 14. And if people, some people might recognize this, and I, that's all I'm going to say, but. My dad and me and my brothers were up on the, there's a road that runs all the way across the top of a ridge from one side of the valley to the other where I grew up. It's called the, we just call it the ridge road, but we just dropped off. My dad dropped me off. There my brother, one of my brothers first, then about a mile and a half, two miles down the road. And, you know, this isn't a two-lane blacktop. This is, you know, way up in the mountains, and it's... Dirt road, yeah, you know, single-lane yeah, dirt road, pretty much. Yeah, I think there has never been a road grader on it, and we we smoothed out a couple spots with shovels a few times, but he dropped me off, and then he went down a mile and a half or so and dropped another brother off, and he could drop down on the back side, you know, about... You know, the it, it, uh, rock falls about five, six hundred yards down the mountain, and there was a trail down below there. He was going to drop us off. It was early in the morning. When we left the house, it was, you know, still way before daylight. So when we got up there, you know, it was still right at the sun starting to come up, but, you know, it wouldn't actually be in the sky for about another 45 minutes. That's when mm -hmm. he dropped us off. And... Uh, he was going to drive around. It would have taken him about a half hour to get back down there and try to push something up to us. You know, we all found a nice spot. And I 
where the road was, I walked up the embankment was about six, seven feet, and then up the little hill up to the top of the ridge and found a nice clump of rocks right at the edge of the trees, you know, to where I felt had rocks right behind my back and some trees, and if something's going to come up, I'd kind of hidden, so if it comes up, I'd have a good vantage point all at, you know, the little low, the little saddle of the ridge. I was up a little higher on one side of it, and so I just sat there, and this is way before cell phones and everything, so, you know, ain't playing a game on a phone like the kids nowadays do. I was <laughs> actually dozing off. But I heard something coming up from the bottom. It's like, oh, mercy, that sounds like a whole herd. But it sounded like a freight train just moving up through. And it's like, man, that's coming straight up. That stuff is rough on that side. You know, you couldn't walk in a straight line 15 feet because that's how thick the forest was. But right. something was coming up there in a hurry and wasn't being quiet about it. So what do you and think at that point? It was like a moose or a bear or something? Because they'll be I think, I was thinking, I was thinking, I was thinking moose. Because where we were at was deep enough back to, away from town that it was either a big old huge bull or a moose. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, you know, neither one of them are going to be afraid of me. But just kept hidden, and sure enough, come up over top of the ridge was a was a bull elk, a nice. small bull. He, he has a spike. You know, but mm-hmm. still, Idaho, our spike, that spike elk was bigger than the elk in Colorado that's 15, 16 years old. Yeah. But, you know, little little young bull, he's probably his second year, but he's still probably 400 pounds. But he's come up over there, and right as he got to the top of the ridge, he made eye contact with me, and it's like, didn't make sense because that stinking thing turned and come at me. And it's like, they usually run when they see a human. And yeah, they run like, away from the human, not toward them. Yeah, yeah, not get closer to me. And it wasn't like <laughs> to gore me or anything. It's just, he's like, well, I know now he was giving what was coming up after the hill after him a choice. Look at that, slow moving elk or this fast one here that's going to be gone. And, you know, I didn't know that at the time, but... That confused me because he came. I could have reached out and touched the side of that thing. It came by so close, and it was it was lathered up. It, it had been running. It had been moving and working hard, not just for a few minutes, for a few seconds. This thing was dang near wore out. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've ever seen like a horse when they get sweaty, elk yep. and deer. Or you can tell that they're sweating, but it's not the same thing. You can tell, but. You know, he's blowing big old huge clouds of steam out of his nose and huffing and puffing. And he, you know, bounds down the hill, jumps off that little embankment on the road, hits the middle of the road, and is gone. And as I'm watching him steadily motivate, uh, something came up that draw right after it, making about twice as much noise. That's what I was hearing, not the that young bull. You know, and I didn't realize that till that bull was gone, and that sound never yeah. stopped, and it kept coming up the hill. Oh, my God. So at that point, then you're thinking, well, what the hell is chasing him up the hill? Well, I was still thinking, holy cow, is he got a big bull after him? You know, here's <laughs> young Spike thinking yeah. he's a tough guy, and, you know, the big, you know, six or seven point, is you know, that's six on one side, not like in – we we're real men. We only count one side, the lesser of the the time. <laughs> but that's what I thought. And then it's like, holy cow, am I going to get to see a big bull? I haven't. Yeah. You know, yeah, I was really close. And I, him up the, you know, whatever's chasing him up the hill has got to be big. Yeah, got to. Well, it's scaring something that's 400 pounds and can move like, you know, you know faster than any horse. And mm-hmm. through the trees like that. And yeah, I didn't know enough to get scared that at that time. Oh. You know, I was hunting. I was hunting deer. I was I was a kid. First year mm-hmm. of hunting season. You know, I had pretty good shot, but it never even occurred to me it, it, that whole time. I'm just sitting there gawking, and then right as I'm like, "Cool, there's going to be a bigger one come up." And man, that thing was that close. This one's going to be that close. And oh. something, the biggest. Um. 
thing that I'd ever seen in my life come up, and all I'd seen was its head and shoulders, and it come up, and it never made it all the way to the top. I never saw from its knees down, so I couldn't tell you if it was a Bigfoot. I never saw its feet. But where I was sitting and that young bull come up over the top of the ridge, that thing was right there, and I was probably five or six feet above that on some rocks. Mm-hmm. And when that thing stopped, you know, with its knees, even with the top of the ridge, I still had to look up to see, look it in the eye. Oh, God. And, and How far away time, from well, was, yeah? Um, from here to the end of my drive, 20, 25 yards max, probably Whoa. less. Yeah, that's close. Yeah, well, forest, I had a good vantage spot that if anything was going to come up, it had to go right through there. I, you know, I, I grew up in Idaho, even though it's my first year hunting uh, yeah. with a license and tag, but I'd been with my family. I grew up in the mountains, I, all over. And that didn't make sense that, you know, it, I didn't think Bigfoot, I was like, what is that? That's it. Uh, like uh, Wes Germer says on his, he's like, oh, what he was thinking was monster. That's all that could pop into my head is that there's a monster right there, and it's huge. And if you've never seen one, and people are like, yeah, why didn't you look at it through your scope? Well, I didn't need to. He's right there. <laughs> Second off, and with what I had, I had a hot rod. Hunting rifle, it's a seven millimeter Audi, seven millimeter with a three uh, three oh eight case neck down for a seven millimeter. It'll reach out and there and touch you. And with what I had in that gun and the way they were loaded, I think all I would do is make him mad if it even affected that thing at all. Yeah. It was, and what I noticed right when it comes up and it put on the brakes and stopped right there and look, look right, look me right in the eye. Give me a once up and down, you know, the, and that's what uh, I noticed immediately was, holy crap, that thing is not an animal. It's calculating. It give me the once over to see. Did, did that make sense? It give me the once over to yeah. see how much of a threat I was to it. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm, even, I'm did he give you the, the surprise look when he first saw you? Because I got he, that well, from the Wendigo when I saw him. That was the first thing that registered on his face was, oh, he saw me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, it was the what I think from the expression it gave me, which wasn't a lot right then, but it's like, holy crap, what is a human doing there? And I'm like, holy <laughs> crap, what is a monster what doing right there? <laughs> so you, and, you uh, guys both had that moment of being startled yeah, by each other for yeah, sure. But, you know, if I wouldn't have been sitting on the rocks and my butt taking such a huge bite out of that rock, I would have shot myself. Wow. But, it, you know, it, it's hard to explain to people that have never seen one. It's it's life-changing. This, you know, I've heard people say it before. You're told from the time that you're an infant by your parents that there's no such thing as monsters. There's no boogeyman. And guess what? In In the blink of an eye. All of that comes flooding to you like, uh, uh, that's a lie. There's monsters right there. There's a monster right there. What is that? Yep. You could take uh, the biggest human being, you know, Andre the Giant. This thing could uh, squish him like a grape. Yep. And what the thing, the, the, after I saw the calculating and noticed that this thing has is, is got a uh, severe degree of intelligence you know that's me the older me now talking but i recognize that this thing is intelligent there and what i noticed was in its right hand it was carrying a rock you know like uh michael jordan or any of the basketball players how they palm a basketball yeah it's carrying a rock like that that is probably three times the size of a watermelon and it's palming it God. and it's like who and that's when I'm like, that rock is probably about as big as my torso, probably, you know, 150 plus, and he's carrying it like I would a softball. Wow. And it's like, 
and the thing that I just like now I know why he's like oh crap there's a human there it's like he's doing the same thing I'm doing but he's like Andre the Giant and Princess Bride when he chucked the rock I didn't have to miss and I did get the idea that if he was to chuck that rock it wasn't going to miss I, I don't know but that's what I felt See, if he would have got a shot at that young bull right when he got to the top of the ridge that's when I think he's going to let that thing loose and here I am standing there and he's like and I screwed it up you know uh -oh. this is this is happening you know I'd say tops 20 seconds but you know it everything slows down and it took an eternity and I know I, I put my hand up and it's like this I I don't remember if I said any, I think I did. It's like, this ain't for you, meaning my gun. You know, the barrel's in the crook of my left arm. I didn't put it up to my shoulder, but it looked at that and it recognized that. When it gave me the once over, it lingered on my rifle for, you know, maybe half a second or more, but enough to, I saw that he looked at my rifle and knew exactly what it was. And then he, and that once over, I could, you could see him look at my hip and there's a, 357 on my hip. He didn't recognize both of them instantly. Mm -hmm. And I, I always, they know exactly what those are. And, you know, I'm just sitting there and it's like, I don't want, I'm just hunting like you are or something like that. I don't remember. Remember, it's been 35 plus years ago. If I said anything at all, I'd probably thought that I was talking, but going blah, 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 blah. And then it, takes the rock, it lifts its arm up from its side, and it's kind of hard to explain, but it put its arm out to its side that had the rock in it, and it just kind of pushed it away with its fingertips. It was palm down still, but just kind of flicked it away, and that rock flew across that little ravine right there at the top of that ridge and hit the, the side of the mountain on the other side, which is probably 70 yards away, and it just flicked it. Oh, God. Didn't, didn't rear back and float. He flicked it with his fingertips, and that big, old, huge rock went like a bullet, you know, from his fingertips. I can't imagine him throwing it. <laughs> and, I can imagine whatever critter it hits is going to be dead, though. Well, well, that bull elk was, you know, probably four times the size of me, and so you use the projectile that's going to take it out. Anywhere yep. he was to hit that bull elk with that, it would have put it down. If he hit yep. it in the back hip, it would have shattered its hips and its backbone. You hit it in the head, it goes down. You hit, he hit it anywhere with that rock, that thing's going down. But after he turned it away, he looked back at me again, and then he lifted both these. He made two fists, and that's when I got terrified. I mean, no words to describe the fear, but made two fists and kind of like flexed. And as he turned around, he went, and turned around and walked back down and disappeared. Like, Whoa. as in, not that, he, you know, he didn't fade away or any, it, he walked down the hill and I wasn't going to walk back over there and watch him leave. Oh, he no turned way. around and walked back down the hill. And the impression that I got was, I don't want to, uh, expletive, four letter F word, when he did the, it's like, Frag, yeah, and just it was just a frustrated roar. It wasn't angry. It was terrifying. But the impression that I got was it was like, "You're an idiot. You're a jerk. You just took my breath yeah. away." Why and, did you have to be sitting right there? I had that juicy yeah. health just about bagged. Yeah, and, and why did you have to come up that hill and destroy my world? Yeah, and make me in. You know, I, like I told you, I didn't realize how much keeping that in for so long and never telling a soul that how much it affects you. And having the people like you guys out there that no judgment, just let somebody come on and no ridicule or anything. If I would have, we had the town drunk in my hometown, and I don't want to say his name, but guess what? He said that a Sasquatch pushed a tree over on him. He wasn't the town drunk until after he told the town that a Sasquatch pushed a tree over on him. They were relentless and merciless in the ridicule. 
Yeah. You know, then it led him to be the town drunk. And what, you know, everybody said, oh, don't listen to that old man. He's the town drunk. Well, he wasn't the town drunk until you guys started teasing him and ridiculing him about something that he saw. I went and talked to that old man because of my family's reputation. There's a restaurant, a little greasy spoon that he always hung, hung out at. And I went by him in there one morning, went over, and I asked him, said, can I ask you a couple questions? He said, just, just leave, just leave me alone. I said, well, if you look up, you'll know, recognize who I am, and, you know, I'm not going to be like that. I said, I just want to know if what you saw is the same thing I saw. And he looked up at me, and it's like, holy crap. I mean, that's the first time anybody had said something like that to him. And then it wasn't right then, but we talked later that afternoon away from there so nobody in town could see. Mm -hmm. But just then, real quick in passing, I I just want to know if what pushed that tree over on you is what I just saw a couple days ago. Because I, I'm terrified. I said, it, it, you have no idea. This thing was um, this is very conservative, but 11 foot. Good you know, God. remember, I didn't see from its knees down, and right. where I was at was about me. five yeah. feet up from there. You know, I wasn't totally standing, but I wasn't sitting either. You know, it's when you're leaning against rocks, so I am, my knees are bent a little bit, but where my feet are is five feet above, you know, the top of that ridge, so I'm up the ridge a little bit more, and that thing comes up there, and he's still, from his knees down, is below the ridge, and I still have to look up to him. Immediately. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, I weigh 200 pounds. And I look down, and it's like, well, I'm 360, and you're a lot bigger than me. I'm a pretty good judge of weight. That thing, at minimum, I, I think I said 750, but I'm going to raise that. I think a minimum 1,200, and, and minimum of 11 foot. But I wouldn't be surprised if it tipped the scale at three quarters of a ton and thirteen and a half feet. Well, if you think of how big the bull elks and st uh, stuff are up here, they'll go over a thousand pounds, and that's not nearly as big of a mass as a uh, nine, ten, eleven foot tall big one is. Uh -uh. So you know, ton easily, I could believe at that height. Yeah. Now I've heard the, you know, the different types, and you know, I've researched Bigfoot as much as I could. The internet's a godsend, too. Try researching Bigfoot before the internet days. You know, there's a couple of blurbs in a newspaper article that is making fun of somebody that saw one, but, you know, people nowadays don't know how much, you know, the information age is amazing for stuff like that, for research. Yeah, but oh, yeah, for decades there was no no organization to contact. There was nobody you could talk to. There was no shows you could go on. There was no place you could tell your story. There wasn't yeah. any social media. And you, you know, if you wanted to research it, well, uh, there weren't even Bigfoot conventions, dude. Yeah, you had, you had to go buy a book somewhere where you could find a book that somebody had written on Bigfoot. Yeah. And there weren't yeah. a whole lot of those. Well, and anybody you ask, it's like, if you've been listening to the village idiot the town drunk and it's like <laughs> why and if you would have asked me before that day just because of everything that i've been raised around just that you know in a small idaho town i you know my first year hunting but you have no idea how i was in the woods and i was pretty good i was a pretty good tracker spent a lot of time in the woods you know a lot of time in the woods on my motorcycle by myself even back then when i was a kid you know, there wasn't a video arcade. There, our closest McDonald's was where you live over in Montana. That's how rural my hometown was. We had to go to Montana to eat at McDonald's. That's right. Montana rules. We got yeah. McDonald's. Right. <laughs> when I was a kid, McDonald's was a treat. Red Lobster, McDonald's, French fries. <laughs> I know so far out in the sticks, it's a suburb of Montana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But seriously, now, when you before we get too far away from this, when you talk to the poor guy who had been totally ostracized and become the town drunk and compared your stories, is the thing that he saw the same as what you saw? 
it, it very similar. I don't think it was the same one, different areas. And his was over on, oh, uh, that gets into a whole nother set of encounters with something else on the other side of the valley on the Montana side. I was on the backcountry side of Idaho side when I saw this one. Mm -hmm. And if we remember, I told you about the ones that we found, that I found on my dirt bike mm -hmm. about a year, year after some stuff happened and the ones that used to chuck rocks at us mm -hmm. that that's over on that that's where he was at was over on that side and that's the one that he said pushed the tree over on him but very uh, similar okay. so that very was over similar. by the montana border then that was on yeah montana that's side. yeah okay. you know it's yeah. drinking that bad montana water yeah. well that's it you know and like i've been saying for a long time montana's got some of the most crabby sasquatches in the entire continent yeah, the, the one Texas beat. <laughs> the the ones on that side, what I've found over the years, you know, I lived in that small little town for uh, dang near 20 years, and the ones on the Montana side, up on the Continental Divide that way, they were m more aggressive. They were the same, I think, type. Or if they're not the type, they're the two that look very similar, but they're two totally different creatures, two right. totally different beings, however you want to say that. I don't no. think they're an ape. I was asked that, and I said the only thing that made me think ape was it was covered with hair, not fur. Right, right. And it, but the one you saw had a face more or less like a human then. Yeah, it, it looked like, uh, you know, some of the cartoons of, a you know, the guy chewing on the cigar with... You know, with a big old huge gun, you know, some of the yeah. animated shows that aren't really for kids, but they're cartoons still. Put that right. grizzled old warrior, you know, soldier's face, put a bunch of hair around it, and, you know, he didn't have a sagittal crest either. That That's what the pointed part, right? It was more right. rounded. It, I didn't see a point, and it was kind of balding on top, but kind of had a... A balding mullet looking thing, you know, mullet. longer, longer in the bed, in the back, no neck to speak of. You know, that was typical. It, his trapezius, where yeah. his as weightlifters call it, their frog neck. His frog neck was the best frog neck I'd ever seen in my life. Big old, huge trapezius muscles, and this, even under the hair, you could see the muscles. I mean, when he's just holding that rock. It's like, man, the m muscles are just, you know, it, it's, you know, I started lift, I, you know, weightlifter, football player, and, you know, ever since I was little, was in the gym, and knowing what the different the deltoids, the biceps, and all of that, and it was like, they're, it, they were abnormal. The human yeah. yeah. They, they already got a short, teeny neck that you can barely even see, and then the traps are so built up, it looks like it goes up to their ears, basically. Yeah, it, it, it looks like uh, the step pyramids. You know, here's the trapezius, <laughs> and then a little bit smaller peak, and that's the head. It's, it is. I don't think it's that there's no neck. I think it's that the, the neck is shorter, but it's the muscles are yeah. so huge. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, no, I, his eyes were, all I saw was black. But that's what got me the most was the intelligence in its eyes and knowing that even though I couldn't, you know, I could see exactly where it's looking, even though there's no whites and it's just a black spot, but you knew exactly where he's looking. And the, what color hair did the, he have? Was he a, was he a dark hair one? It, it kind of, it was like a, a, the dark auburn. He was very dark, but had kind of the reddish um, almost like maroon highlights. Okay. But that could have that could have been the orange morning sun coming up over the mountains too, because you know, where we have clean air, it's not you know foggy looking from the pollution. But you know, a sunrise is nice bright orange on a good nice day. Right. And now is that me seeing a lot of the orange from the sky, or was it actually that color? But it's dark brown, really dark. Okay. And and you would I can see why. You know, in a forest where there's a lot of shade and a lot of dark spots, how, you know, he could, if he would have stood, if I would have been walking by there and he is standing right there, 
if he didn't move, there would probably be, you know, if, if I did none of the noise and everything, if I was just walking down that ridge and he stood right there, there would be a 75% chance I would have never saw it if I just walking by, if it didn't yeah. move. And this thing is, you know, as big as my Tahoe. <laughs> I know, it's just scary how damn sneaky they are. They're gigantic, and yet they're incredibly sneaky. It doesn't seem like the two should actually go together, but they do. Yeah. Well, it wasn't that one, but, you know, later on I found out that, you know, who Usain Bolt is? Your your average tubby Sasquatch could catch him in a blink of an eye. Yeah. The fastest human being on the planet can't hold a candle to an your average Sasquatch and speed. Now, well, let's get to how how you found out this sort of stuff now, because that's the next thing that comes up after you had this unfortunate encounter while out hunting and had the big boy with the rock run into you. Yeah. Um, why, why don't you just let us know how this all happened with this other situation where you ended up actually being able to interact with one of them? Okay. Well, you know that that it's a long story. We got a little bit of time. We got plenty okay. of time. Go ahead. Yeah, because you know, like I told you, there's there's a lot to it, and we just barely scratched it. But okay, well, you know, the next year, that year, um, I don't really want to, I don't want to tattle on myself, but back then, you know, we didn't have the tree stands that you go down and buy, and you unfold it, and it goes 30 feet up the tree, and you put a strap around it and lock, you know. I had a milk crate that I strapped to the back fender of my motorcycle, my trail bike. And one to the front, and I made six or seven trips up. And I'd, you know, scrap lumber and go to the lumber store and get any of the spare two by fours or and stuff. And I would go up and I'd find a spot and I'd make a tree stand 35, 40 feet up a tree. And in a spot that you couldn't see from the road, you know, I'd ride deer trails on my bike. I'd ha- had a couple spots picked out, but I built the next year starting at the spring i built four tree stands all in different (laughs) parts of different parts of uh you know the mountains there's two in this one particular area and you know they're probably there well there's this one good meadow that i found that i knew had a lot of activity i could see you know a lot of sign and i built the tree stand in a douglas fir on one side on the uphill side of it and then i built one in a big old huge uh, wasn't a dub for a regardless one down on the downhill side on the opposite side of the meadow and you know about seven trips per stand you know I didn't have a ladder what I got was the big old huge you know it's basically just a big nail but it's you know three quarters of an inch around and about two and a quarter feet there's a buck and a half a piece These, that was a lot of money back then too yeah. it was all out of my pocket but I'd get, you know, as far apart as I could get them, pound them into the tree about halfway, and, you know, I'd have about a foot sticking out, and I'd climb up and make a frame, you know, however wide the tree was, I'd pound a two-by-four in on either side of the tree, and then brace it down, and I'd make it to where I could sleep up there. It was a pretty nice tree, tree stand. Nice. I'd make it make a platform, and then I'd put one-by-fours, you know, about an inch apart and make a deck on it. And then I'd put two by fours up and a rail up about eight to 10 inches up from the bottom of it. So I could actually sleep up there, you know, not stretch totally out, but I, and I would always strap myself up to the tree when I'd sleep. But a couple of times, there many times I'd slept in the tree stand that I'd built. But it was the next, the next year. And before, you know, by the end, middle of summer, I had four good stands made, and I wanted to try one of them two first. And no, no, okay. So this wasn't. It was. It was late archery season. Excuse me. The early archery season, I didn't. I didn't actually get to, and I didn't get a deer during rifle season. So it's late archery. Excuse me. I had to think about that for a second. So this is uh, late January, early February, middle of winter, but because I didn't get a deer during rifle season. I think I kind of intentionally did that because I wanted to go up and spend a night or two in my stand and see if I could take one with my boat. Kind of middle of the winter. Oh, fun. Yeah, well, 
that, you know, in the middle of winter that I have the advantage if I'm up there. And if I yeah. go up there the night before and when they're coming up from the river getting a drink and you know, I've been up there all night, you can't smell me. No. And and I'm up there, you know, I'm not 10, 15 feet up. Remember, I minimum of 35 or 40 feet up the tree, way, way up there. Yeah. I mean, it was actually pretty pretty scary on that one it was way up there on this this first one but sure enough and now during rifle season one thing that the Idahoans don't like is people coming from out of state you know on the in the draw areas and somebody from California drawing an elk and the people in Idaho getting screwed over for it so here, here yeah. it's the nothing against that state it's just the way that they act when they're in another state doing something like hunting, they have, they, you know, the one, the, it's pretty bad that the few that are bad, they give all of them that come up and hunt a bad name. But uh, another story, just real quick, my brother was shot at, he killed a deer, and three guys from California started shooting in the general direction, trying to run him off, because it was his last day of deer season, rifle season. And it's stuff like that. I did not blaming the whole state but it's that's the reputation that they had but it, so during rifle season there's a rumor around town that these guys from california had killed a male and a female sasquatch and it was squashed pretty quick because they said there was a new fishing game officer at one of the checkpoints thought it would be funny to say that these guys from california you know, killed a male and a female Bigfoot thinking they were bears, you know, and that was how it was played off, and it got squashed pretty quick. So, you know, and I heard, everybody heard about that, but then you mention it, and it's like, oh, that was that idiot new fishing game officer thinking he's funny. But, uh -huh. and, then, and I didn't know what, you know, Anytime you come out of the mountains during hunting season on Idaho, there's a checkpoint. And if you're hunting, if you've got something or not, you've got to stop. So, and they, but I didn't have to because I didn't drive on the road in a truck. I took my motorcycle, and it is, it is winter time. And luckily, it wasn't super deep, but I had studded snow tires that I'd made out of sheet metal screws to help it get a little bit better grip. And the country kid, we didn't have video arcades. We had to. Anyway, I went up there and parked my bike and climbed up there. Now, let me back up a bit. As I was building this, particularly these two tree stands at this meadow, I had the base built and the spikes up to the top of the tree, and I needed to go back to town and get another load. And so I left my backpack up there. You know, and it had, you know, some... Uh, granola bars had a bag of beef jerky well deer jerky every year with in my family when we'd you know we'd always get several deer one of them would turn into deer jerky and that was always in the freezer and you'd go on a you know next year hunting or anything you do you always take a you know one pound bag of jerky and I rode back to town on my bike it'd take me about an hour and a half to get back to town an hour and a half to get back there you know that's a kid on a dirt bike he, uh, up on deer trails it's quite a ways back away from town yeah but apparently. when i got back there my backpack was on the ground and i thought you know and there's no coons up here it's not there's you know little and little critters that could get into it but they would have tore through the sides or you know there's a porcupine they can climb a tree but you know something unzipped the zipper and got in there and anything that was to eat you know all my granola bars i had some of the atomic fireballs they were gone i found two or three of them just on the ground you know, right around the bottom of the tree you remember those the little red yeah cinnamon flavored uh atomic fireballs in the beach yeah yep. and it, it just struck me as odd that if it was a bobcat or a cougar or a a porcupine or something like that, it would have tore my backpack up, but it was unzipped. And just the food was taken out of it, so I knew it wasn't a person. I had everything hidden to where, I mean, you could walk right underneath my tree stand, and if I was quiet, you probably wouldn't know I was up there. But 
you know, it just struck me as odd. And then, you know, that was probably middle of the summer when that happened. And then I got it finished, and I didn't go back there because I wanted the animal to get used to, you know, that here's my scent all around it, building it. And then I wanted it to be totally free. And then during hunting season, it didn't when I'd go back. And, you know, it didn't get anything during rifle season and late archery is when I went up there. I spent the night in the crack of dawn, you know, right as the sun's starting to come up, I heard movement. And sure enough, that right as I figured, them deer were coming right up through that meadow. they nice. been right down at the, at the river drinking, and now the sun's coming up. They're going back up to hide and bed down for the day. And right is, you know, as they got to the edge of the meadow, I'd had everything, you know, in the summer, I had everything ticked off. I had all my pins on my sights lined up. And right as he stepped right by that one tree down there, that pink pin, and boom, dropped one right there. Perfect shot. Right. Never knew I hit him. And the other ones looked at him like, what's Bob doing laying on the ground? <laughs> but, you know, my string was silenced. It just barely made a twang. Had a, yep. had a a uh, 90 pound compound that had been cammed up to about 115 at Easton game getter arrows. They were the three prong broadheads that when they impact three more blades shoot out, aim the back way. Right. And that arrow went through him, went through his heart, went through the other side and pinned him to the ground. Then it wasn't until I got down out of the tree and got over there that the other ones are like, Oh, I uh, guess we should run now. But I, <laughs> drug, I, I drug him farther back, planned on staying there a day or two. And that's, a, you know, one night and the very next morning, I hadn't even been there 24 hours, and I already got one. So I t- drug it to the other side of the meadow, big one, and I hung that thing up. I hung it probably about 35, 40 feet in the air. So a bear or a lion comes and the rope is tied. I had spikes up to where I had tied it up in the tree, so you had so an animal wouldn't be able to get it when it's hanging there. They might be able to get underneath of it, and I know bears can jump, and mountain lions can too, but they couldn't jump that high. And I steadily farted around. I rode my bike a little bit until I just had enough gas. I always carried in my milk crate. I carried three quart oil jugs full of gasoline, and it took me two of them to get back to town. So when I was out of gas and all I had was those two left, that's when I rode back. I just exploring it. it was a nice day. You know, that next day, the day that I killed that, it was just a little three-point buck, you know, three on one side, two and a half on the other, about 190 pounds or so, probably three, four years old, nice gear. And, you know, nighttime came and I was tuckered out, had fun. You know, the big old huge adrenaline rush right in the morning, and now it's sunset, and my adrenaline dumped a long time ago, and I was tired. And I climbed up there, got into my sleeping bag, tied myself in, you know, to the tree stand, and fell asleep. And I woke up to what sounded like somebody, you know, like somebody frustrated, throwing a fit, kind of, but kind of quietly. Mm-hmm. And here I am. This is, I don't know what time it is. Uh, time X Indiglo watches hadn't been invented yet. And, you know, it's a nice bright moon, and there's snow on the ground, so what little bit of moonlight did reflect pretty good, too. And I see somebody standing underneath my deer, jumping up, trying to get at it, and just crying and throwing a fit that they can't get to it. And they go over to the to the tree over there and look and it just standing underneath of it whining trying to join a fit and it's like you, you jerk that's mine you get away from there and it's like what's this i'm gonna scare the crap out of whoever this is and i you know slowly luckily my tree stand didn't crate or the rung to get up it i got over on the back side of the tree went down got to the ground and i took off running as fast as i can what the hell do you think you're doing? That's my crap. That's not a man. And then I'm like, I'm got wool socks on, boxer shorts, and my camo pants and everything. It was a warm night. I had a Sub Zero mummy bag, and it's like, um, my 
pistol up there, so is my bow, and I'm standing here in a t-shirt and boxer shorts and wool socks, and that's not a man. <laughs> Whoop. And it's like, whoa, stop and turn around, and I think he was as it scared the crap out of it because it turned to me and looks at me like, what in the hell is that? And I'm like, what in the hell is that? And we both turn about face, and he takes off that way, and I go back up the tree. And when I turn, went that, now this is what's weird. That looked exactly like a chimp, only it was a chimp that was a little bit bigger than I was at that time. And, you know, at that time I was about six foot, maybe 260 pounds. That's a big kid at that time. So here I am in this chimp. You know, I get, what is it, the billy ape? The big, the chimpanzee that's bigger than a human? And yeah. when it took off, it took off on all fours, and it runs just like, you know, National Geographic Channel, when you see a chimpanzee run sideways like that on all fours, and yeah. hooting and hollering and screaming. It was doing that, but it was like, ah! What I figured was, holy crap, it saw me, or what is that? But it ran off that way, and I ran back up the tree. And oh my god, that must have scared the crap out of you. I mean, even after uh, having seen that big one previously, it's still like, well, there you are, Earl. you're by yourself. Well, no, no, time. no, no, I, I didn't think it was the same thing. I really didn't. It's like, you know, Trip, there's two different kinds of monsters. <laughs> no, no, it, big, I know chimps aren't that big. That's a chimpanzee, but it's brown, not black, and it's bigger than me. Mm hmm. And what kind of circus freak is that? I've seen the bearded lady. I haven't seen the big seven, six and a half, seven foot tall chimp. It, it just, it, you know, it, it still, it, it didn't occur to me that it was, later on I found out it was a juvenile Sasquatch. He's probably uh, not an adolescent, but not a teenager either, kind of right there in that transit. He's about, I figure he is about my age. Right. That's the one that I had. Over time, we had a lot of interaction with. And actually, as I got to thinking about it, you know, that thing, what happened over, I did stay two more days there. And that thing was always at the edge of the, of the meadow that I was at. And I got down and it stayed the same distance away from me. And the, the next day, I got over to the, near where the gut pile was. And the gut pile had been devoured. And I saw that. You know, this thing, there's footprints and stuff all around there. I could tell that this thing is eating it. And thinking about it, it's like, well, crap, that thing's hungry. And it's right then that it clicked. Holy crap. I bet you that's not a rumor. And I bet you 100 bucks this is the, the child of them two that the Californians supposedly killed that was a big, big, hilarious joke. And yeah. I, I mean, it did right then and right there. It it clicked. It's like, and it, it was confusing and it was heartbreaking at the same time because now I realize it wasn't. It was starving to death and it was trying to get that and it was frustration because I hung it up so high that he, you know, now looking back on it, he was that thing was jumping up there pretty good. If I would have hung it five feet lower, he would have got it. But he wow. was going. He was going up there. I mean. It put Michael Jordan to shame on his vertical leap. <laughs> and then this and this is and this is a kid. This is, you know, just past toddler, not right. quite teenager. So you're you're figuring this is this guy the uh the two Bigfoot that got shot were his parents and so now it was an orphan. Yes. And that, that's wasn't kind old of, enough to know how to fend for itself very well. Yeah. Now that night I pulled my deer down and I cut a front quarter off of it and I set it there was over there near the gut pile, but closer to me. And I set a front quarter on there, and it, you know, the sun went down and it's still sitting there. And I knew it was there. I could hear it. I couldn't really see it. But I could. I knew it was there because I could hear it whining. And it was like, you know, when a dog wants to come and see you, but it's scared because it's not been around humans, but it wants the attention, and it wants to come get that dog treat out of your hand. Or that yeah. you know piece of food that you set down there, but it's just too scared to. The whole time and until about midnight to one o'clock, somewhere in there, it's when he finally give in and come over and grab that. And I mean, didn't even wait to get back out of 
eaten the clearing to start eating on it. He grabbed it and started eating it right then and then back to where it was. Oh, man. And you know, it was hard, it, it's hard to explain. I, at that point, from that point on, it was no longer scared. I was, I felt sorry for it because I'm like, you know, if somebody killed my parents, how, how would I fend for myself? Yeah, and I don't exactly. know why. Here, here I am. What am I? Fifteen, fourteen, fifteen, somewhere in there. You know, like yeah, I honestly, said, this, if this, it was this around your size, here. yeah, if it was around your size, it was probably more like the human equivalent of like a ten or a twelve-year-old. So yeah. imagine like a ten-year-old trying to fend for himself if both his parents got killed. Yep. And you know, I didn't know it, but later on, what I found out is they did. They got a. Uh, male and a female and uh, infant because it was then after I got back to town from that what I told you about happened right after that after I got back to town right you know that's when that happened and you know so that rumor that it was when I saw that it was maybe a week after that or less than a week after that rumor got started that I had that very first encounter with that one Wow. And over the course of the next, after I killed that deer, the next two and a half, almost three full days and nights, it's when I stayed there. And, you know, I got in trouble for missing a day of uh, of, of school, but it's a small town. And, you know, hunting season, you're giving up to two weeks. You know, it, that's just I didn't ask for it off. I was supposed to be back on that day. But, you know, small town. I got a... Wow. Uh, just make sure you tell us next time. Did you get something? Okay. Well, yeah, you did. Ever all's forgiven. <laughs> yeah, because I did. I got one. <laughs> different era, different time, different place. You know, you know, uh, tell you it's a different era. In my high school, there was probably 350 rifles out in the vehicles in the parking lot. And when yeah. two kids got in a fight, did anybody go to the truck and get a gun? Or your hunt no. night? Did... No. no, they stayed there. You settle it like two men if you're going to settle it, and that yeah. you don't ever do that. I mean, now if you go to school and you accidentally have your your hunting rifle, your shotgun, and your buck knife in your vehicle, they're going to haul you to jail. Yeah. But when I was in high school, we had shotguns in our lockers because there was skeet shooting class after school. Yeah. yeah. Now, where do you want me to go from that? Oh, it gets into well after you spent your initial weekend with them uh, up there and fed them. Did uh, did you see any more of them? I mean, did he haul like that uh, quarter off and eat it somewhere else, or what did he? Yeah, get? well, that's what I why I stayed the extra day. It, by the end of that, I had actually we had actually made physical contact, and it was uh, this is where it gets it, it gets incredible. It it was. Well, how did that happen then? Well. <laughs> The next night, I baited him a little bit closer with the other front quarter and got him about half the distance from where the previous night was with another quarter. And you know, that was the thing that was impressive was how much that thing ate me is still starving to death. It, it, but it was, it was, you know, you could tell it was thankful and he was still hungry, so I put it out there the next night, but half way closer. And you know, it didn't take him right as the sun went down is when he grabbed that one. And then he set, didn't go into the trees. He set at the edge of the trees. And I sat on the ground that whole day. I didn't go up in the stand the whole time I was on the ground. And you know what I mean? I didn't, yeah. I, I, and my, my bow and everything was up there. And it's like, crap, I, if I don't want him to be scared of, I don't know if he, they, his parents got shot with a rifle or if he saw it or, you know, all of this going through my yeah. head. It's like, you know, from the time that I put two and two together, I felt sorry for him and I wanted to, it, you know, like it, it, you take the lost puppy home with you. Yeah. If if my mom would have let me, I would have taken him home just like a pup. But I I knew that there's no way that I can tell anybody about this. No, because of what Friends I friends won't believe have. you. Next thing you yeah. know, you'll be living under the bridge with the guy that had the the big foot pushy tree over on him. Yep, and so I the next night it's when I had a 
one of the other hindquarters. All I went to town with when I went back to town was a hindquarter. And I said, well, that's all I could get out. And that it was really rough, and I cut it up into quarters. And the next night when I went to get it, the rest of it had been, you know, gotten to by critters. <laughs> so all I got to town with was one hindquarter. But the next night, the next night it was, or after that night to where he was closer, and he didn't hide from me that night. It was the rib, you know, rib cages, and I cut them up with a good knife. I, you know, not just a whole rib cage slab. I'd take a rib, you know, and the meat off of it. And I cooked some of them just over my campfire, and I set one out there even closer than the where the front quarter was the night before. And the smell of my the meat cooking on my campfire that third night, or the beginning of the third day, the second night after I killed the deer, you know, I cooked a big old chunk of it for myself, and the smell of it that was driving it driving him nuts. The smell of that meat cooking was just too much, and by, I'd say, 3 or 4 o'clock, he was on the other side of the fire from me, taking it out of my hand. When I cooked the rib and handed it over there, and the first couple, it snatched and scooped back 8 or 10 feet, and by the 4th or 5th rib, he was sitting right there and scooting closer to me, waiting for the next one to get done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, apparently cooked meat tastes a lot better than raw meat. <laughs> yep. Right. It was just the when the smell was just, you know, if if they are, you know, they're not exactly human. I don't think they're at all. And I think they're a, like the Native Americans think. I think they're they're a type of people. Are they the yeah. same as us? No, but you know, they they have cognitive thought. They can calculate. They can reason. That's a yeah. that's a, that's a person. That's not an animal. Something that can outthink you, something that can flank you, something that can hide from you as smart as we think we are. And I know why so many people don't believe in Bigfoot, because they are the world's best at hiding from us. Mm -hmm. it, do you blame them? They have had a, you know, their TV is humans. And look yeah. at what humans do to each other. Why would they yeah. want to reveal themselves to us? Look at oh, what no, happened to no his way. parents. No way. Yeah, we're look scary. At, look at what happened to his parents. But yep. it, at the end of that, it was a child. It wasn't an adult Bigfoot. It was still a child or adolescent, whatever you want to call it. And so was I. I wasn't old enough to know that I should be crapping myself that this thing is right there. I didn't know <laughs> at that point that that thing could grab my head and rip it off and rip my arms off and beat me with them. And he's a baby, well, little past baby. But at that yeah. point, me being I'd a big child, tough kid, probably, yeah. me being a big tough kid lifting weights, there is I, as tough as I was and as strong as I was, I couldn't hold a candle to this toddler when he was that age. Yep. And he was he was probably four inches taller than me, and but man, he was at least two hundred and fifty pounds more. But, you know, that first initial I thought about my size, yeah, about, but it, you know, their muscles got to be twice as dense as ours. Mm -hmm. And that, and that is it. But, well, let me tell you, this is what killed me and set me up for how the next five years of my life would go. But on that last night that I was there that I had to get back to town the next day, I actually, I left the mountain and wound up in school from my tree stand that night. That that last night there, I spent the night with him, and he, when he, we finally touched, he started crying and gave me a hug and latched on and gave me a hug and would not let go for probably 45 minutes and cried just like a little, oh, baby, course, like a little kid would. And I, I, I started blubbering too. It's like, I know I did. If, if, what, if, if what I think happened to you, I, I can't imagine how you're feeling. Yeah. And, he would look up at me and cry and damn man, damn it. Sorry. Can you imagine putting yourself in that in his position? And it's not an animal, it's a person. Hmm. Yeah, and his family got murdered and he's out there all by himself. And, and he I, finally and found I, and somebody I, else that isn't I, trying to hurt him. I, 
I realized that when I was 14 years old. Well, yeah, I don't blame them from hiding from us. Look at what happened, what we as humans did to each family. Yep. And I just thank God that I'm the one that happened to build my tree stands there at that perfect spot where I knew the deer had come up. And like I said, I didn't know where supposedly this had happened. It was just, I think it was meant to be. I don't think he... he I don't think he was starving, you know, totally starving to death, but what he was getting his sustenance was growing rapidly less and less because in that area he had got every rabbit and squirrel and uh, it turned out porcupine too because I picked a couple of quills out of him in the middle of that night and roots and, and tree bark. And uh, it was uh, – the next morning, he did not want to let me go. And when I tried to take off a ways, he, he would follow me. And it's like, oh, no, this is bad. I can't let anybody else see him. And right there, that, you know, at twilight till, you know, that three and a, to four hours to where I've got to be in town, get a shower, and get to school that morning. What I realized how intelligent these beings are right then it's just amazing. And that's when I learned his name. They have names. That's not an animal. That's a person. He told me his name and I told him mine. And, and not in sign language. He said his name and he said my name and I said his name. And they said as close as I could get to what it sounded like. You know, and that's not an animal. No. Animals don't have a language. Animals don't cry when their mother and father are murdered and their little baby brother or sister. They don't look for affection even on the thing that caused them the most pain. Yeah. You know, they all, you know it was a hum, human that did that to him, but yet it's a human that he's getting comfort from. And, you know, that broke my heart and was, it, you know, and I'm a kid and you know, ever since then, that changed my life because, you know, it's hard to explain. But from that day on, I was a different person to people of all races and sizes. You know, and that Sasquatch people, that's a race of people. You know, that's not – I didn't have the same type of interactions with any of the other ones. In fact, they're – well, we talked about the ones on the Montana side. I, I wouldn't want to give them a hug. Because, <laughs> yeah, they got a bad reputation, man. Yeah, I think well, ones over here drink too much or hung over all the time or something. Yeah, if, I, if one of them gives you a hug, it would be the hug that, uh, you know, squeezes you in, too, like, <laughs> like bread dough. Yeah, make your head pop off. Yeah. Now, that was what was weird is the ones on the other side, those – I can see why you have a you need to be afraid of them. These ones, like him, they're two totally different people. I think he is a person. The other ones, they're more animal-like and they are terrifyingly and they are aggressive and they are eating machines. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. if if you are edible, you're on the diet. It doesn't matter. How bad do you think you are? Doesn't matter if you're a bull elk. Doesn't matter if you're a grizzly bear. Doesn't matter if you're a polar bear. Doesn't matter if you're a whale. You know, I don't know if that had happened, but anything that they can eat, they're going to try to eat. And I guarantee you, a human ain't going to stop them from eating it if they want to eat you. Yeah. No, not even close. There's nothing physically that we could do to stop them other than having a bazooka or a flamethrower, yeah. Andy. Well, uh, uh, semi-automatic Barrett 50 cal with yeah. two 300 rounds of depleted uranium, you know, that stuff that'll punch yeah. through solid steel. Yeah, yeah, you better have a bunch of those and like 20 people shooting at the same time at it to try to slow it down. Multiple trigger pullers because there's always yep. usually more than one of them around. Well, you're in the weird situation where there is only one of them, so... You make contact with Glog, and uh, you end up having to go back to, to town to go to school. And so the whole week passes, you're in town. You were in town all week again, I'm, I'm taking it. Yeah, well, I, I took off that Friday and was back up there the next uh, first thing in the morning, Friday morning, right. because I had chores and stuff that had to be done and work, and then went back up for the next weekend. Well, 
you already got it here. What are you going for? Well, it's still hunting season. They don't know I got one at school. No, so I'm taking three more days off school. <laughs> and now this this gets into <clears throat> man, how do I say this? I had brothers that didn't treat me very well, so any chance I get to have to get away from there, it it's like when we talk. He saved me, and I saved him. Did, did that make sense? And that did you have all older brothers, or were you a middle kid, or what was? I, I was the youngest. I was the youngest. You were and the youngest. Okay. I had all all four of them on me every day. Oh, they God. never four spotted them up themselves. Yep. Oh, they never. God. They they never did anything to each other. It was always four on one, and that's you know, at ten years old, that's an eighteen year old on a ten year old, a yeah. sixteen year old or 15-year-old and a 13-year-old, all against a 10-year-old. And I would say, they did this, or I'd tattle on them. What? Mom and dad tattling. And the other, the other all four of them say, I'm lying. You know, I, I, I don't blame my mom and dad. I know it was tough. I now understand now that I'm adult and have children. I'm in looking back with an adult's eye. Now I realize what? stresses my mom and dad were under back then because of totally different circumstances but when a kid comes up and starts whining about his brothers being mean to him and the other brothers say he's lying and you know I don't blame them it's my brothers for using that situation to their advantage and the fact that I don't bruise never have I have a pain threshold through the roof and it's obvious with the health issues that I have now and what I withstand but they use that to their advantage because I say they did something. Where's the mark? They could beat the yeah. snot out of me, and it wouldn't leave a mark. That's yeah. the curse of having the type of heritage that I have. But Viking, Scottish, uh, Apache, and a little bit of Cher and Cherokee, you know. And so I don't know that mix of genetics and none of it. We don't bring it. And you'd have to hit me with a with a deuce and a half military truck to get me to leave a bruise. <laughs> and so anyway, no love lost kind of, between you and your brothers, and you were more yeah. than happy to be spending time away from them. Yeah, and well, what I said about the the intelligence of that person was just astounding because on the on the ground by the fire, I drew a box. You know, just with a stick. And I drew a crescent moon. And I pointed at the moon, pointed at, this, at the big little box there with the moon, and I said, that's the moon. That's nighttime. And then I drew another box and drew a round circle with spikes coming off of it and pointed up in the, si in the, in the sky and said, sun. And I said, night and day, you know, this plus this is one day. Mm -hmm. And it only took 10, maybe 10, 12 minutes for him to get the concept down. Okay, when the moon is up and the sun is up, from right now, the sun comes up and then the moon comes up. And then the sun comes up and the moon comes up. That's two days. They grasped that concept right away. And I told him I would be back in four days. Four, four suns and four nights. On the fifth sun, I would be there on the fifth sun. And I drew a picture of the mountains. And right as it's coming up, the mountain right in the morning I'd be up there on the fifth day in the morning and he was right there when I left where he was at where I drew the pictures he was standing there waiting for me when I got there on my bike five days later wow and then I got went into oh crap I got where is he sleeping we got to find him a place to live and luckily knowing you know, I, I grew up in the mountains. I knew that why I picked that area for my tree stand is I knew that area pretty well. And it's like there's some caves over there that, you know, and at, at that time, thank goodness, there was nothing else over there but him. Because I could just imagine me going into a cave trying to find him a home and me and this little guy go in there and have a couple ten footers in there and wake <laughs> him up. You know, yeah, they, they really wouldn't like that. Like, oh, in retrospect, <laughs> I, I had I had 
15 or 20 guardian angels watching over me and him both because we both fumbled through the next three years. And just for some reason, both of us made it through. And, you know, I didn't know what habitation was. I didn't know you don't feed the Sasquatch. Yeah. Every time I go in situation, though, if he didn't have some help from you, he might not even have survived. And that, that's that's when I turned into um, a lawbreaker, but I think for a good reason because, man, I don't want to say this. It sounds so bad. I became a poacher, but it was for the right reason. I would, yeah, I would every time I'd go back, I'd kill an animal for him, and it was not wasted at all. It wasn't for a trophy. It wasn't to hang on the no. wall. It wasn't for anything. It was to for food. And I don't think there's anything wrong with anything feeding themselves. I don't think that if somebody is starving to death, if they have 50 cents to go buy a bullet and have a rifle, let them go kill an animal and if they're going to eat it. If they go yeah. shoot a set of horns to hang on the wall, hang them out to try. I don't understand how you guys can stand to listen to my voice. I can't stand to hear it recorded. You can tell that guy right there grew up where there's a barn in his yard. Well, well, I did. I grew up so far out in the sticks, we didn't have a barn within a mile of us. Uh, well, we we had the Sears catalog in the outhouse for toilet paper. Oh, Sears okay. catalog, luxury. We had old dried leaves we used. But anyway, <laughs> get back to the, uh, to the story here, so... So you kind of made an arrangement with him. You got enough language between the two of you where he could figure out yeah. how long you were going to be gone and when you would come back again. Yep. And and you went. Did you take him down to the caves and did he just sort of follow you over well, there? We, well, well, he, he, I asked him. I said, you know, where do you sleep? And then I laid down and closed my eyes. You know, like you would like with a little kid. I put my hands under my head and I laid down and acted like I was asleep. And he's like, right. oh, ooh, 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 ah, ah. and then he. What I figured out is they talk. Their language, it's like you put it on super fast forward. And I, I always wondered, I wonder if they have developed uh, their speech into being so fast that humans can't understand them. Because they can definitely understand you. You ask any Native American, if you talk to them in the Native, in the Native American language from the area that they're at, they can understand you. And a lot of times they can respond to you in that yeah. language. Yeah. It's just they have to slow it down. But I just always thought, did they speed up their speech just so we couldn't understand what they're saying? And he would, when he'd get excited, you know, it, his vocabulary in my language was pretty immense, actually. But by the end, you know, his name was, should I tell everybody what yeah. his name was? His name is Glag. That's in how I would spell you know there's no dictionary and there's no written language but right. spell it phonetically but according to his pronunciation of it his name was Glog yeah his oh, name was Glog it was and even when he was young it was Glog 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 yep yep and he would call me it just it was it just imagine like a little little kid from India Jimmy mm-hmm. or Terry but when he had learned the words, uh, what else was it? And trying to think, a tree stand. It was always it was like when you see a little kid trying to learn words. Mm-hmm. There's strange it, parts of it. Yep. But in a voice that is way too deep that you, as a, me as a human, cannot, and he's in it. Oh, he's got me. It's a little kid, and he's got a deeper voice than I got. <laughs> he was so lucky that he ran into you. Any yeah. other human, I think, probably would have been bad, bad news for him. Well, and that's like when, well, after that first night when I learned Glag, and, you know, it took forever, you know, what is your name? And then it's like me, Kevin. Kevin. Now, that's my name, and then when he finally got that, he's like, that's when it was, black, 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 and it took me forever to you know, slow down, slow down, slow down. I think I told you, when he'd talk, when he'd get excited, it was, he'd go back into that fast speech. And that's what got me, is because, you know, figuring out over all of this, that it was a, that he's a young guy, that he's a little kid, but yet he could talk, 
and that means his family could talk. That means these things have a language that he talks. But and then figuring out that, uh, you know, it's slow down, slow down, uh, uh, Kevin. And he'd be like, dag, 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 dag. it just sounded like, you know, the samurai chatter. Yeah. And then it's like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he'd look at me like, what in the hell are you trying to say? <laughs> and then he's like, oh, okay. Uh, and then slow it down. And then that's when I finally got, after about two hours, it's after me telling him, Kevin, and then, then Kevin. Then it was like, okay, then that's when it's like, Glug. And it's like, Glag? Or is it Glack? And he's like, when the, you know, Glack, yo, know, Black, Drack, all of these. And then it was when I said, Glag. That's when he got excited and moved <laughs> right back up this talking on super fast forward. But then, you know, I would, whenever I'd go out there, I'd, every spare second that I had from then on until the day that we parted ways, you know, it, from right then, it's like I want him to be able to get back into, you know, I'd never thought about it. I'd seen the Patty film once, you know, and it, I didn't know anything about him. Like I said, the Internet's amazing now. But yeah. I well, wanted to work. Back then, there was just no – dude, even if you were in a major metropolitan area, the amount of information on these guys was just non-existent. And you were out in the middle of nowhere. Yep. And then out in the middle of nowhere from where my town was, you know, and you go about 30 miles past there, and that's where we were. You know, it was uh, – you know, right there where he was at, there were some caves, not like super huge and deep. The main part was a, just a rock ledge overhang. But down at the bottom of it, it scooted back, and it went back about 15, 20 feet and opened up into a little bit bigger. And that's where he had hid. I don't know if that's where his family was. And, you know, I don't know. I still don't know what exactly happened. All I know is that the first time he saw me with a rifle, it freaked him out bad. My pistol was something that didn't bother him. But, you know, it never heard it go off. All he had ever heard me shoot was my bow. Right. You know, and it doesn't it doesn't go bang. And that was the trick because it was about a year later that I you know, could it get well not quite a year, next hunting season. And it's like, um crap, how do I bring this up? And I said I brought pictures and I showed him photographs of guns and it's like um your mom and dad is this you know trying to get across you know did your mom and dad die because of this and it took a long time but then he finally realized what the picture was and it's like yeah i got upset and angry and you know destroyed that photograph but you know it wasn't anything important it was something that i took and just a, a bunch of different guns, pistol. He, he had seen my pistol, but he had never actually seen it out until, and I said, this right here, boom, boom, bad. Stay away from it. You know, and from the day that we started, you know, from that first time, it's like, you know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm all right, but you know what happened to your mom and dad? Stay away from humans. Because yeah. most of them are going to try to do what they did to your mom and dad to you. And me, I'm different. But you can't go to town with me because they'll they'll be mean to you. Did just me and you? You know we're friends. And you, uh, crap, you know. It must and, have been so hard to get across to them because from what I've learned from Cat and a few other people that have had interaction with them, they just don't they don't understand the concept of lying or that uh, sort uh, of thing uh, at uh, all. I was just gonna say that the lying is a strictly human concept. You yeah. know. Truth, brutally honest. Never once do you have to wonder if they're lying to you because it is not even in their thought processes. Yeah. They they have a excellent sense of humor, but it's like the old silent movie type. It's all a lot of physical Slapstick. comedy. Yeah. yeah. And now a, you know, a joke, you know, that is basically a funny lie. It doesn't, you know, lie. No concept. That mm. is what. When I heard you and Kat talking about on, on that show, it's like, okay, she knows. That right there, if, no, I didn't believe anything else. It's like, okay, she does understand that. And if somebody, yeah. that's something I listen for, it's somebody 
said that they have had interaction. It's like the 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 brutal truthfulness of them as a being. You know, and that that may seem weird, but look at my position and what I experienced. And I know it's a unique situation. And I didn't think there was anybody else in the world that would have anything near to mine. And that's why I was so terrified to ever tell anybody. You know, it, I told somebody else before I ever told my family. It wasn't, it was been within the last six months that I finally opened up to my family that I'd even seen one. Let alone, uh, that don't need, they don't know this part yet. It's not like the easiest story to tell, that's for sure. And my brothers are like, you know, why didn't you say something back then? I said, well, you remember when we were hunting and you and we, you said, did you hear that moose? Did that moose run by you? Because, you know, when oh, that God. thing, the first one goes, Rah! remember, they're about two miles away. Right. And you hear, you know, I, it sounded like, you know, 16 elephants coming up through the trees. What they heard was thump, 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 and they thought it was a moose running across the top of the ridge right behind them. And that was that thing in that bull elk running up the ridge where I was sitting. And they were a mile and a half, two miles on either side of me, and they thought a bull moose was running behind them. Wow. And when they, when Dad picked us back up, nobody got anything that day, obviously. Well, when he did his frustrated <laughs> yell, that, uh, they must yep. have heard that pretty well then. They, well... I, I said I saw a, a young spiked bull, and they said, "Was was that a, his sick bugle?" And I said, "Yep." And he said it sounded like a lion roar that with a with a cold. And I said that was that spiked bull. Oh, and when they said, "Did you did you hear that bull? Did did you did you see a moose? Did you hear that? We think it was a moose that was running by." And I said, "Yeah, I heard it. I I think it was a." But uh, it could have been a moose. It sounded like an elephant running on a sponge. It's what they said. <laughs> and it's like, man, that that was from them being so far away, and you know the way the mountain distorts sound. Yeah, that thing that running at weird. that freight train sound coming up through the trees sounded like an elephant running on a sponge, a wet sponge, where they were. And then it sounded like a sick elk bugle when he goes. Oh, you idiot. You know, he didn't say that, but that's the idea, yeah. you know, when he did that thing. It's a, man, he needs to grow up and learn how to bugle. Like, <laughs> yep. You know, when I said, you know, when, I said, you remember when you we heard that bull or that bull moose run by? And then they said, yeah. And I said, I, well, it wasn't a moose. Well, what was it? And I said, it was a big foot. And they're like, yeah. And I said, look at me. You know me well enough to know, am I lying? No, I can't. When I'm actually telling a lie, I can't stop laughing. I, I am the world's worst. I give myself away every time. And I said, well, why didn't you say something that day if you knew that's what it was? I said, what would have happened if I would have told you right then that I just saw Bigfoot? What would have happened to me for the rest of my life if I would have said that back yeah, then? Would have never, got, never heard the end of it. Yeah, and they both were, you know, able to me, okay, yeah. Said, well, just the way that you're being right now, see, you're still wanting to get into that. And you know what? I don't care if you ridicule me now. I'm old enough. I'm not a little kid anymore. And with the evidence that's out there and the people that have come forward to see it, if you tell me that I'm insane or I'm an idiot for believing in it, it joke's on you because... You know, it's I, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt now that it's real. The the cover up that I think is going on, it it that just buffaloes me still. That it, it's obvious that you're trying to cover up something that can't be covered up. That ninety percent of the people know about and believe in the other the other people that say they don't believe in it. You know, in the back of their mind, they're like, well. You know, I'm one out of six thousand that doesn't believe in Bigfoot. Yeah, Bigfoot is so well well known and part of cultural legendary here in the West at this point that more people believe that Bigfoot is real than actually believe that certain political candidates tell the truth. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and the fact of the matter is, it is up in the percentages. There's like you know twenty five thirty percent of the American population is willing to concede that there's a pretty good chance 
that something like that is running around the woods, and you've got thousands of eyewitnesses, you know, four or five new ones every week that are coming forward. That's not to mention all the ones that are seeing something and not coming forward. Yep, and, you know, if 1% of them is telling the truth, if even one of them is telling the truth. Yeah, well, yeah, well, even that. But if 1% of the hundreds of thousands of people that come forward every year, if only 1% of them is telling the truth, guess what? That means it's real. If one of them is telling the truth and everybody else is lying and hoaxing, that's the thing that always got me back then. Oh, it's a massive hoax. It's a worldwide hoax. Who is the mastermind that can get every person and all the people in every country in the world – to to be in on this hoax, yeah, right. I mean, yeah. that you guys are that's asinine. Well, you know, we figured it out what it is. It's a big plot. The NBA is involved. Um, all the basketball players, you notice, like they're on the court and stuff during the winter. You never see Bigfoot during the winter, and then during the summer, they're not working. That's when they're wearing their shaggy uniforms, <laughs> running around out in the woods, leaving giant fake tracks for us to find. And so, it's in so, their contract yeah. in, the, in the off season, they got to be part of this secret uh, society that's mm-hmm. been around for thousands of years that fakes yeah. Bigfoot sightings all over the world. So that's like like Eddie Murphy. You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Your wife's a Sasquatch, isn't she? You shaved yeah, her you down and taught her to talk. Yeah, you shaved the dumb Sasquatch and just married it, didn't you? Just Goody it. goo-goo. Who said that? <laughs> he uh, stuck his face yeah. in the water and pulled a fish out with his teeth and said, Goody goo-goo. <laughs> Goody goo-goo. <laughs> Your wife's a big foot, ain't she, Gus? But, you know, there's, you know, what, what I just told you just barely scratched the surface. Yeah. Of what I had experienced, and what I think is really cool, you know, not for me, but for them, is that everything that I know and have I have experienced isn't touching, scratching the surface of what Cat has. I would love to be able to talk to her, because oh, you know, going through my whole life like this until, you know, it was right at about a year ago is the first time I had ever opened up and said anything about this. And it was like uh, this vice was taken off of my chest, you know, and I didn't realize that it, you know, it was affecting me the way it was, but it is. And, you know, you hear, you know, listen to the channels, there's good ones and bad ones, but all of them that are listening to people without judgment are helping people. And you can hear somebody say that. And until you, first time you talk to somebody like that and they're able to open up and finally after 30 plus years say i did see this i mean it's it, you can't understand how much it helps somebody like me that has had to keep that inside for so long because i'm afraid of the ridicule yeah. you know, i'm so glad that the times have changed you know because well it took a, a good christian man and turned him into an alcoholic and a mean alcoholic because yeah. of of something that he saw that he had no control over, and he just made the mistake of asking for help. What happened? He, and he, he, when he came to town, it's not like he's like a big foot pushed a tree over on me. He needed help because he was injured bad. Yeah. And he said the Sasquatch pushed the tree over on him. He was in his tent when it happened, but you know the, he was pinned underneath the tree. And the thing was trying to get to him, and I don't know why, but it got the tree was it bigger than it could handle it or something, but it got it to where after a couple hours, he was able to dig himself out, but it couldn't get him out, and it was in a position to where it couldn't really hurt him either. Yeah, I guess the tree was big enough, but here he is injured bad. You can tell a tree fell on him. That half of him is a pancake, mm-hmm. and when he limps, he gets to his vehicle and gets back to town in the hospital and says that's what happened. And from then on, every person in that town was relentless about ridicule. And it would just, I mean, turned a, a good person into a mean old drunk. Yeah. And it's something beyond his control. And it just, I'm just so glad those times are now past. No, it's, well, just, you know, I know this is sort of off the topic of Bigfoot, but I've actually done outreach to homeless people. 
And when you get to meet them firsthand and find out what their stories are, you find out, much to your surprise, that a lot of these people are not homeless because they're crazy drunks. They became homeless, and that turned them into crazy drunks. Something horrible happened to them that completely destroyed their life, and as a result, they ended up with nothing on the street and had nothing else to look forward to and just became crazy drunks. Yeah, Yeah. well, because... It, yeah, that's all there is. You ain't got enough money to do anything, but you can go buy a cheap bottle of wine and get drunk and forget about everything for the night. Yeah, yeah I, I I understand that too, but so many people don't. And yeah. you, you you find out that those crazy homeless people that's drunk there on the sidewalk, you know, he's a person too. Come, we'll come back for another for another part on this. So okay, folks, we're gonna have to uh, cut her short for time constraints here. We are definitely going to be having Kevin back to tell more about his interaction with his squatchlet buddy and all the stuff that happened while he was interacting with him over the few years that he knew him, up to the point where uh, he didn't see him anymore. And uh, I'm sure that you guys are going to find this just as fascinating as I do. And thanks again for coming on the show and sharing this with us, Kevin. Uh, yep. Really, no really, really, really uh, thrilled that you have the uh, intestinal fortitude to come forward and tell the story. Most it's people just wouldn't. Kind of blessing so. and a curse, getting it off, but then, you know, it brings back all that that happened, the good and the bad. Yeah. But I think it's a good thing. Well, and, you know, it's one of those stories that ju- uh, it needs to be told, whether people believe it or not. In the long run, as more information comes out, they're going to be able to vet some of the stuff that you're going to tell, and they're going to be able to know if you're telling the truth or not. And it's going to be one of those things like Al Osman, yeah. where everybody thought he was completely crazy, and now all the stuff that, you know, yep. the top researchers are coming up with completely matches with information he gave. So yep. it's pretty hard to call him completely crazy at this point, because everything he came up with seems to match what we've come up with in intervening, yep. what, 100 years. Yep. Um, so... And right, well, we told you about that. That's already be, without ever anybody knowing about that. Well, we'll get to that later. But you know what has been seen there that has freaked a couple people out. Well, that's for another show. I'll I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a cliffhanger for you guys. You hate me for those. Cool. And we once again have Kevin with us, and he's giving us some more uh, on the the leg saga about him and his Sasquatch buddy. And last time we talked about how the whole situation began, and we're going to pick it up from that first year still and cover uh, all of the, uh, you know, most memorable, important, or uh, otherwise uh, needful parts of the first year for you folks to listen to. And I I told Kev the first thing that we need to do is give everybody a good description of what – what Glag looked like when you first uh, met him and were feeding him pieces of deer around the uh, campfire. All right. You just take right oh, up elk, where we left me. off. Yeah. 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 Um, it was deer. The elk was the, the very first one I saw. That was. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm the sorry. Closest thing you look that he, I can explain is a chimpanzee. Just bigger. You know, like I said, he's a little bit bigger than I was at that time. But with some human features, but like a chimpanzee. Well, by the way, we sort of we sort of know that Swatch, you know, they they get more massive and fill out a lot more as they get bigger, just like humans do. I think what people are really interested in is what what was his hair color, what was his skin color, what was his mm-hmm. eye color, what his facial features look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, to start with the first one, the the hair was. Almost black, but uh, hints of still that auburn color. It turned yeah. like more into the dark brown as he got older. And eyes always black, always black or dark. I, you know, that's where with him being my buddy, not just something that's, you know, it's something I never focused on after right. that initial initial time, that introduction, if you can call it that. But, um, you know, a hooded nose looked like, you know, your typical boxer. I hate to sound like a broken record like everybody else, but that's exactly what it looked like, a big old huge flat nose that's been punched more than once. Right. <clears throat> but.
but not, you know, it's like a human nose that had been broken, not a, not a primate nose. Right. And so you like maybe yeah. more like the, uh, uh, the nose you would see on like somebody, uh, Aboriginal Australian or something like yes, that, where they got exactly. a big, wide, flat nose. Yes. And uh, skin color, kind of charcoal, a little bit darker gray, but, you know, not a light gray, but not black either. Kind of you know, uh, ashen, is that mm-hmm. the proper term? Yeah. And round head, not conical. Never, never the, all the ones that I've seen have never been conical, like a lot, I guess, of your typical squatches. They've always been more round right. from the well, ones yeah, that I've you know, seen. There's some, me and some of the other people that are investigating this think that there's more than one kind across the country, and you know, mm-hmm. I'm real sure of it. So, you know, the ones with the rounder heads uh, generally get associated with the reports of the ones that we look class as type twos. So yeah. that doesn't surprise me because type twos are all over the damn place. Type ones are all over the damn place. Um, so you could easily be running into either one of them. And from what I understand, the troops don't like mm-hmm. war with each other, but they don't like interbreed and share territory either. Yeah. So uh, you know, uh, yeah, you, it's it's total uh, you know total just luck of the draw as to where you're going to run into when you're yeah. out there. Yeah. Well, you don't go across the river. You don't go to the Montana side of the river. You <laughs> stay on the Idaho side because they look the same, but they are not at all the same temperament-wise. Yeah, yeah. And again, we mentioned that last time that the ones over here on the, have a stinky reputation, and it goes way, way back. And yeah, you know, <laughs> they're crabby over here for some reason. But apparently, yeah, they're I, crabby in, in northern Idaho too. Judging by the last time, uh, the last guest that I had on here. Yeah, I heard that one also. Um, now, can you hear me all right tonight? I realized what I was doing last time, yeah, sitting around I can hear you and just nervous. Fine. Yeah, yep. Okay. It's, you got to remember this is still this stuff is it's the first time I've ever talked about it ever. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, you know, as far still, as the skin color goes, what we were just talking about, you're uh, most of the sightings that I get from the more northerly areas uh, report that skin color. I don't hear a lot of people talking about brown-skinned ones up in the further northern areas. They seem to be black or gray. Okay. That that I didn't know. I Well, like I told you, the only person anywhere around where I grew up was considered the town drunk, and he didn't tell a lot, you know, after that initial, you know, letting, running into the hospital and saying he has a, a Bigfoot pushed a tree over on him, but you know he didn't talk yeah, about what it looked like. Yep. And then you never got to tell a lot of what what its skin color was or anything. No, no. But this was again the ones that were over on the other side of the valley. Uh, yeah, closer to yep. Montana. Where the, the closer to Montana you get, the grabbier they are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's no pumpkins in Idaho, so I guess they're pretty ticked. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I need to move out of the banana belt over here. Well, anyway, mm. so so he had this sort of um, uh, a, the dark colored hair. He had a darker gray colored skin. His eyes, from what you can remember, were just really really dark. And yes. the the, uh, the first one that I saw in the daylight, uh, that's what its eyes looked like to me. I couldn't make out any detail at all. It just looked like black. It was shiny black. That was it. So, uh, you know, not surprised by that, but just that, you know, and repeated um, times of seeing them or anything, if there was, like, very much in the way of color in them or something, you know, it, it seems like you would have noticed it at some point. Yeah. Now, that's something that I didn't really consider. Uh, it's just it, one day, you know, this is on down the line, just jumping ahead, just just a tiny bit. I just realized that, holy cow, he doesn't look anything the same way he did when I first saw him. When I realized, holy crap, he's huge. But that's a couple of years down the line. That, but oh, we'll get into that later. But when it, that realization finally came to me. But so you just want, you know, every time I went to the mountains, it was an awesome experience for me. But... 
you know, that first year, you know, the hunting season was tricky, you know, for the rest of that. But that the whole mix of that for that year up until the hunting season was actually pretty fun. That's where we're just learning how to be friends and how to communicate and how to, you know, does that make sense? How, how to be friends with. Sure. So how, to, did you do, how did you do that? What kind of experiences did you guys have during that time? Well, uh, how I told you, you know, they have a very visual sense of humor. You know, and in the spring when I'd been up there, one of the times I was up there three or four days straight and I started getting stinky, which is something I'll get into also. But I took a bath in, in the creek and he laughed his butt off when he saw me naked because I, I was naked. And that was probably a day and a half of him. <laughs> From then on, he'd lift up my shirt and laugh. <laughs> but and that's when that spring is when I was like holy cow I, your feet are big because I pulled my boots off and put my size 12 and a half next to his probably size 16s yes. and it's like and then that was funny too because my foot was so small and it was pink and tiny and no hair all over it that just cracked him up. <laughs> and then the words and oh mercy. The you know, it just there's so much that you know, just learning how to communicate with each other. But it's, it's kinda hard to explain. There was a connection since that very first you know, that first week that I was up there when yeah. all of that initial stuff happened. From then on, we were best friends. And well, it's how just, often were you up there visiting with them? Like every every week, every month? Uh, uh, yeah. It was it, it, as long as I every chance that I got. It, never more than a a week or two in between. Even if it was just I went up for an afternoon. And usually I try to go up for a little bit longer than that. You know, when I couldn't, at least maybe just a night. But in, in in the beginning and middle of summer, in between working and everything else, yeah, every second that I could. And, you know, like I said, it was a different time, a different era. And, you know, as a kid, we didn't have any of the stuff that you're used the kids in a big city are used to and so if you haven't been raised in that it might sound far-fetched that a you know a 15 16 year old kid would hop on a motorcycle and go to the mountains for a day and a half well if that's where you grow up you know it that it was nothing strange about it to me or anybody else you know, yeah, in the well, when I was the kid, it was the same thing. I was up in northern Minnesota. My nearest friend lived three miles away. Uh, yeah. My nearest good friend lived five miles away. <laughs> and all I had around me was a whole lot of woods and nothing else. So guess what mm. I did all the time? I was out in the woods. There wasn't really anything mm. else to do. Now, to us, driving up and down the street in a, in a loop in a big circle, driving up and down Main Street, that's kind of foreign to me. Mm -hmm. You know the kids that went cruising or going and sitting in a parking lot at a at a you know like a McDonald's or something and everybody sitting around talking that that didn't happen there you know what I mean it's different era different time different place yeah. so it, the people that haven't been raised in that it might sound totally foreign or even far fetched but you know the stuff that city kids do seems far-fetched to me but yep. I'm that, that's something I'm, it, so I'm right there with you brother that's something that i mentioned was every time that i made a you know when i would come back to town and i would you know would sit at, when i would be back there never was he not there i mean that's what i mean about the intelligence when I told him I'd be back in five days or three days or 18 days, he was there waiting before I even got there. He was there at the spot that we always met at. 
And, you know, that that still to this day blows me away that how can it be an ape or a, you know, just some animal when you can schedule a time and he understands it and meets you there every single time and more punctual than most humans. Yeah, it's pretty abstract, too. I mean, obviously, he's smart. He figured that out right away. He had that one the first time you met with him. Right, right from the beginning. Yeah. So is that, like, how you went about trying to get things that you could use for operating purposes to, like, communicate with them, like try and teach him words in English and show him a little yep. picture on the ground or a picture from a yep. book? Or... Yep, and I like I told you before, I I took a lot of photographs up there, and it wasn't very long of looking at it until he finally understood that, okay, you know, this photograph, you know, it that's hard to under, explain, but it wasn't very long until he understood that he's looking at a picture of something that's real, even though it's not real in front of him. Yeah. But, and that's how I would, you know, try to communicate with, you know, it's like I told you on my tried to show him a picture in a recording, you know, the old cassette recorder of my other bike. But when I came up on that bike, he didn't come around. I mean, he wasn't waiting. And I think thought it was more the sound of my old bike. And that's when it, when it give up the ghost, I had to do my uh, best to rebuild it. So when you, so when you came up with a different one, he didn't recognize the sound, so he didn't show up. Well, at least he, he was cautious. That's a good sign. Yeah. Well, and that, that all plays into how I explain and not to trust people. Yeah, I'm a people, but... How the hell did you do that? Well, wait, uh, you're going ahead of things. Let's go back to the first year here now. Okay, yeah, all right. Work your way up to all that. Well, the... You know, the first, you know, 10, 15 times, it was just going up there and playing with a friend. I mean, we were both kids, and I took... So what kind you know, of playing took, did you do? How do they play? I took, I, mean, I, took a, I took a I took a I took a baseball the first time or softball, and uh, no, that's like me him trying to play catch with a grape. <laughs> but he, he likes yeah, he likes got all a that catcher's stuff. mitt. It shouldn't be that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just trying to find it and pick it back up out of that catcher's <laughs> mitt and throw it back. <laughs> I'll keep everything in the first year, but the chronological order of this stuff in that first year might get a little mixed up tonight, but it's all going to be in that first year. Uh, But I took up a a blanket because, you know, I get cold. And down where we had set him up to where, you know, in that small cave, and that's something that, you know, the human side of me. But actually, I took that. I took, man, I took a whole bunch of that. It was eventually, you know, like the cherry balls that you have in school that for dodgeball or for kickball and stuff. That's actually the ball that we'd play with. Actually, just kicking it around, kind of playing Sasquatch soccer. <laughs> because catch, catch with one of those isn't. You know, when you try to catch it, and it bounces all over. But just kicking it around and rolling around and just up there. And chasing the, after it. Yeah, it's almost chasing indestructible. After, yep, bouncing it off a tree and playing keep away. Now, that's the when we played hide and seek. You know, that concept was long and hard trying to get across but you know when you go hide you come find me or I'll try to come find you but don't stay hidden so long that I can't ever find you <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah I would have been real careful about trying to get that idea across before yeah. I ever tried it but and you know the ready or not here I come and every kid cheats looks under their armpit and try to find where they're going and I could watch where he run to mm-hmm. which you have no idea how quick you would get from point A to point B. That took a long time to, you know, 
come to grips with that there's no way that I'm ever going to outrun him in a foot race, so we didn't try to try to race. But watching him go off a little bit further deep in the tree than when he'd go behind the tree, I could go back. I mean, and you should be able to see him hanging out the other side of the tree, and he's just gone, just disappeared. But I'm not saying anything supernatural about it. It's just the ability that he had to blend into the environment and stand so still that, I mean, it's just like he disappeared. Yeah. Like like he cloaked, but I know he's not. He didn't. I'm not saying that there's some out there that can't. I'm just saying I never saw it. It's just. Well, as time went it, on, did you get better at finding him? Or was he was he always like a, a super super successful and completely eluding you? Um, I can't remember any time that I actually won. <laughs> <laughs> How good was he at finding you? I suppose that wasn't too I, tough. I, I, well, I don't think he ever lost. If I never won, yeah, it didn't matter what I, I could go. I could go up, you know, find a tree that I could go up and go way up. And it, it, I, yeah, I could, I tried down a bunch, a bunch of branches and stuff one time for the next time we played. I even planned ahead and pine needles and stuff. And when I ran and hid, I buried myself under pine boughs and dry needles and everything. And uh, 30 seconds after I stopped and just laid as still as I could. He'd come up and found me. I think he's cheating. He's probably using his sense of smell. Yeah, I, more than likely. <laughs> and, and it was always it was always scary too because in a in a good way because he'd always roar with you know oh, I found you type of thing not like it, in <laughs> anger but that still plenty and, loud no doubt <laughs> yeah well and it's. You know, as the months and years went by, that roar got that laugh that sounded less and less like a laugh and more and more like like a roar, even though I still knew it was a laugh. But as his voice was getting deeper, which, you know, it was a, it was a bass drum as it was when he was little, it, yeah. and it just got deeper and deeper, and, man, just – when he had laughed, you could feel it, not just you, – you know what I mean? You could – when he had laughed, and it would vibrate your insides. Uh, just the power that they have just in their lung capacity, it just – man. What? I'm just trying to imagine you playing hide-and-seek with the Sasquatch when I was a kid. I know I'd be able to whoop ass on all the normal kids after that. They wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> Uh, I, one thing I noticed was people were asking about smell, mm-hmm. and the I, like I told you there the smell that I smelled was like when your dog's been out playing with you all day, not like yeah. a wet dog smell, just an animal that needs to take a bath, and that's yeah. something that that's where my human side come across, and it's like, Glag, how are you ever gonna get a woman when you smell like that? And that's when he watched me. You know, bathe in the creek. I didn't use soap and shampoo or nothing, but I got in there and I used some of the red moss that you know grows in the rivers and creeks around there. Actually, if you pull it out, it's not it's not super great, but still it has a pleasant aroma. The right stuff. Not that there's some of it that smells like like swamp water, but if it's the <laughs> moss that grows in the quick moving streams and stuff it's not too bad and i'd rub that under my armpits and it'd get in the water and play with me and i think that might have been you know that's where the human side of me you know man you need to take a bath but it was never anything it was never anything like you know the people report the you horrifying know, smelling like, yeah yes that i i never smelled that yet that's for another night though but the, the 
thing about it that's just that for it's just all that little stuff and there's so much of it i mean if you want to help ask a question and point in the direction but you know it's just you know i took a ball up there i took a brush so you what is happening it? to the ball did it get popped or uh, did you guys just lose interest in yeah we, we, i went to, i went through a whole bunch of them <laughs> yeah a whole bunch but so where were they going? Was he like playing with them when you were gone, and then things would happen to him? Or? Yeah, I think once he just wanted to see what had happened if he squoze it too much, because oh, when I came back, okay. it was it was blown out. You know, just had the big rip on it like an elephant set on it. Mm-hmm. And there's one time that we was like playing, uh, not really kickball, not really soccer, where we just in this kind of little meadow, not really meadow, just a open patch in the trees and we'd just kicking the ball back and forth and he stepped on it and goes, kaboom! <laughs> and blew it up. Did, did it surprise him pretty good when that happened? <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see the expression on his face but his eyes got big. <laughs> that, that, was the, that was the thing that always was, you know, when, when he'd get surprised, the the reaction when he'd get, you know, that, that surprise reaction, you could, I could tell that the holy cow, that could be, uh, how would I put it? I'm glad he's my friend. Yeah. <laughs> not, nothing ever really, you know, bad happened. It's just that seeing go from, you know, happy, glad playing and having fun to instantly getting scared and that, for that minute or, you know, for that few seconds of that, when he's scared, it's like, man, it, the whole atmosphere changes and everything. And then it had taken a little bit to get back into play mode, but as soon as he saw that it wasn't, you know, anything to actually be afraid of, but that, that always, that was always tense because man, it's just, you, there's no way to explain it. He's so big. There's no way to explain how fast they move how quick, you know, and just all of that. And when you see something like, when you see something like that and you see that instant to where it's just the reaction to being scared, it just, everything switch off and go to that real quick. It just kind of, it was a little bit freaky at times, Mm -hmm. but you know, that I'd take, you know, like kids' storybooks. I had a little kids' storybooks that I'd take up there, and I would read around the campfire, and he loved me to read to him, which was, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it was just cool. I would, you know, like, uh, I think it was uh, the Dr. Seuss books, you know, how, you know, how Dr. Seuss, how, the rhy- how it rhymes. And, yeah, words rhyme, yeah. Yeah, he loved that, just listening to it. And, you know, I told you, we communicated, it was more with, you know, watching each other and know what the other one is thinking or wanting. But, you know, there's a lot of the words that he had that, you know, that when, well, Fire, he loved fire, 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 fire. He'd always get excited when it was time to build a fire. And then, oh, that's a pretty cool story. That's when he wanted to learn how to light a fire. Were you making and, fires all the time you were going up there and visiting? Uh, not not all the time, not all the time. There was only when it was for sure that there wasn't anybody around or it was going to be a how how do you know that? But on the days that when it would socked in, and you're not going to see a stream of smoke, and yeah, because you know when the side's too close, you couldn't see smoke over the next hill anyway. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the time. But no, the fire wasn't always. But sure. yeah, well, and uh, you know, late 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 at night or you know early morning, and it was a small one. You know when. Right. But he was always excited about fire always and wanted to learn you know because i had had a a lighter and you know he'd always see that he wanted to try that and that wasn't working there's no way you know 
even if yeah, I had would have had a zippo. It was just a bick back then. But you know that when your thumb's bigger than the whole lighter, it's kind of difficult to work it. And there's one trip I took a flint and steel. You know, just the little fire starter, not really with magnesium, and you know, in the strikers where you shave off the magnesium, and showed him how to do that, and you know, it took forever. But the sparks when you hit the striker and the sparks just tickling to death, and <laughs> there's try to imagine uh. Andre the duck giant trying to take two toothpicks and uh, strike them together and make sparks. Just, it didn't work very good, but he always wanted to try. <laughs> but like I told you, whenever you get excited and what words you did say, you'd start saying them real fast. And it's like, fire, 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 fire. Oh, me do it, me do it, me do it, me do it, me do it. <laughs> You just felt like you were there with Beavis. <laughs> I, I, w- I always wanted to, you know, to show him stuff like that, like a TV. And well, you know what I what I was just thinking of is after you're reading them these these uh, kids books and he really likes the Doctor Seuss one, you know, I wonder if he memorized any of it. It'd be pretty hilarious hearing a Bigfoot uh, reciting some Doctor Seuss on the woods. Uh, you'd know to be if you should be horrified and run away, or if you should just be completely freaked out and wonder what was going on. Yeah. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> yeah, right. I do not like good eggs and ham. Yeah, I do not like him, Jim. I am. <laughs> I can see how he'd be interested in something like that, though, because it's so rhythmic and the words rhyme and everything. Yeah, and you know, and some of them are nonsense words, and they're made up just so they do rhyme. Yep. Is it or does or does? So, how, did he get very exasperated when he couldn't get the fire thing to work? I mean, I've heard they have like they have like fits like little kids sometimes when they can't get things yes. to work, and they get kind of yes. exasperated and, with it. And that's where me and him being together for so long from being so little to where, you know, me saying, okay, okay, just let me do it. You always say, you know, your hands are too big. Your hands are too big. Yeah. Okay. Uh, But as always, whenever he'd get frustrated at something like that, just, you know, the calm tone and tell him, okay, it's all right. I'll, I'll do it. We can try again next time. But I would always recognize that fit coming on beforehand and try to nip it in the bud. Mm-hmm. And then him just being excited that now that the fire's going was usually enough that, you know, it had, it had calmed down. But he always wanted to try. That's what was kind of cool about it. But the frustration on something like that did come pretty quick. Yeah. That would be kind of really dangerous to be around, too. Yeah. The losing mm-hmm. temper. That's that's where I that's where how I was what I was try, trying kind of getting at is man seeing that you know if, if that's what I meant by I'm glad we were friends that he would recognize you know from early on that he is a lot stronger than me yeah you know that was because there's times that we were playing and you know it hurt me not intentionally and. You know, then he'd feel bad, but that's kind of a good thing from early on is he, you know, understood that he was way stronger than me. I mean, yeah. and I wasn't I wasn't a wuss, neither. I was pretty tough as a kid. But Even tough kids are total wimps compared to a Sasquatch. You know, the strongest guy in the world is a wimp. To a young yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah, there's there's no comparison. You can have the guy that can bench press, you know, the most weight of any human being, and your average, you know, young teenager Sasquatch is going to be four to five times stronger than him. Yeah. That just the the strength that's unfathomable, how strong they are. 
and that's why and fast. See, and there's two things that keep that people should keep in mind. It's not just that they're big. It's not just that they're strong. They're also fast. They don't move slow and lumber like big elephants. And when they run fast, they don't have to make very much noise doing it. They no, they they lightning. I don't think is as fast as they are. When they're in a hurry, uh, you you're not, you could be watching them run, have your eyes on him, and if he is in a hurry, you're not even going to see it. I mean, I think you can move faster, you know, at top speed, then you're going to be able to, your mind's going to be able to process, which is... It, hey, I got another question what, for you. You got to chase the ball around and, and kick ball and stuff like that with him a bunch of times. What kind of a posture did he run around in? Was he bipedal all the time? Um, it, The first year, it was a lot of both. When he would take off and want to outrun me, if the ball rolled farther away, he'd go down on all fours and just book it. But when we were playing like that, it'd be standing up. But when he'd cheat, he'd go down to all fours. <laughs> okay, so at least he knew that was cheating. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're playing against a human. We don't do that. That's cheating. Come on, man. <laughs> I, 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 and that's kind of funny you said that because I brought that all up a lot. It's like, no, 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 that's cheating. <laughs> You're faster than me as it is. You can't go to where it's even faster. In a hundred yard dash, give me a ninety five yard head start and on all fours he had beat me. <laughs> well, you didn't have multiple ones to watch him between themselves, but Taylor tells me when he gets to watch other, you know, variety of them interacting. And they're they're all very competitive, and they like to have contests with each other. Yeah, for you know, yeah. like things that we would think like five year olds or you know eight year olds would be like, oh, I can climb that tree faster than you. No, I can climb that tree faster. And yeah, they actually do stuff like that. No, well, like, it's the like time. they're competitive about everything. Well, he did like to win, like when we were playing, and even yeah. though there's not like a goal or anything, when the ball would go rolling, it, he wanted. I don't think there was many times that I ever got to it before he did, but <laughs> he liked, you know, winning. Yeah, that's definitely. But who doesn't? Who doesn't yeah. like to win? Now, so let's jump let's jump forward for just a second here, as you were alluding to there. The first year he was running around a lot on all fours. No, after that, so he wasn't running around on all fours as much. Did he sort of switch to being bipedal all the time, or was it just because you know you weren't playing kickball with him? Well, it's from what I saw when he was with me, I think it's because I was always walking around like that. He did. And as he got older, it was, you know, as he started getting bigger, it, I didn't see him go down to all fours very much after the first probably year and a half or so. And just to how big he is getting and how quick, I swear he was getting bigger every every. Every month he was bigger, but also, like I told you, I fed him very well. I always made sure yeah. he was well fed, and I don't know if that's yeah. if if well, it would have been just his troop on in the wild if they would have got as much as he got because I was helping him helping provide it for him. But you know, almost every yeah. time I went up, I got him another animal. So he was eating a damn good diet. You know, probably easily as good as he would have had if he was with the troop. You're definitely yep. giving them enough food to eat. Well, and, you know, and that's like with any other animal or human or anything like that. If you give them a good diet, they'll just naturally grow to be bigger than they were already probably going to be. <laughs> and in a Bigfoot's case, that could be pretty damn big. And, you know, yep. again, uh, just because they're shaped like us doesn't mean that they're going to grow like us and, and, you know, already being predestined to be probably twice as tall and way more massive than a human you would expect that they would grow that much faster and they would need that much for it, more food. Can you imagine what it's yeah. like being a Sasquatch parent? It's probably they only have one kid or two kids at a time because it would be too tough to feed them otherwise. Exactly. Well, man, and, you know, when we'd, when I'd cook, you know, deer in, you know, in one sitting, you could put away – Know, and I'd never something that I noticed somebody in the comment. It was never 
you know, I was never trophy hunting. I was strictly, you know, to for food. And it was the first one that I saw. We tried to make sure it wasn't a wet doe, but, you know, I wasn't out. I never hunted for a trophy. I always, my whole life, it was to provide food, always, even when it was, you know, when we went hunting, when it was with my family during hunting season, it was never for a rack. It was never to hang something on the wall. It was to put something in the freezer. Right. And just wanted to let that be known. It was never for anything other than sustenance. But, you know, if you got a 140, 150 pound deer, you know, with just hanging weight, you know, Gross. half of it, half of it in one night was nothing. You know, here I'd have pretty good portion of a, you know, a chunk, but what he would consume was, you know, what I would consume in six months by myself. <laughs> you know, oh, have that have the 140 pounds hanging, you know, what is it, uh, right around half of its bone, but, you know, the meat, it just, it that always impressed me how much you could put away and then be hungry again the next day. Or two days later, you know, it just, it, the more, if, I imagine if I had enough food that we could eat 24-7, you know, it, uh, you know, all you can eat Chinese buffet. He's gonna bust their average. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Titanic eater. So, how much do you yeah. think, from what you can remember from the first time that you met him and fed him, until about a year later, how much bigger did he get? Um, he was probably six to eight inches taller in that first year, and probably about two hundred more pounds. Wow, so another uh, so another one of me weight yeah. wise back then, and I was getting bigger too. But and I was growing fast when I was a kid. But you know it was a drop in the bucket to what he grew. Right. And wow. that's another thing is you know at night when yeah we'd cuddle up with buddies you know like when we'd sleep. You know, on the blanket that I took up, I actually wound up taking up another blanket and some yarn and sewing a couple of old wool moving blankets. Mm -hmm. You know, sewing a couple of them together. <laughs> Taking a so of size ones. <laughs> yep. And, it, you know, when I'd sleep, would uh, lay down on that down there in the, in the cave and cuddle up together. Not like, not like spooning, but, you know, just. I don't want it to sound weird, but you know, it's, it's, no, you're taking a nap with a big foot. It doesn't sound weird at all. <laughs> when you say it like that, it's see, like I said, it's not. I didn't think about any of that. You know, I, it was, he was just my buddy, and it you know, yep. tuckered out. But that's when I think when I went to sleep, he didn't. You know, I think that. When I was up there at night, it, it's when he is on alert, just in case. Yeah. I, I got that impression early on that actually when I went to sleep that he was on guard. Mm -hmm. And in the daytime, that's when, you know, there was more than once that, you know, you can hear a motorcycle or four-wheeler or, well, back then it was a three-wheeler, but or a truck or something, and horses there's a, a few times that you know humans came close and uh there's a fishing game officer come up to where i was camped and making sure that he got out of there and stayed out of sight which all he had to do was run off into the trees and but that that was that's interesting. Well, did okay. you teach him to stay away from the fish and game officers too? Yes, I did. Especially I, stay away from those guys. In the, uh, well, it was uniforms, and that's one thing that I took pictures up of. It's, you know, the, the fish and game uh, coloring book that the kids get that 
shows the fishing game officer and mm-hmm. and you know pictures of in the police officers and forest service and adult, you know it's especially these people stay away from and then you know the pictures of the rifles in you know yep. what happened there and you know just those are you know what hurt your mom and dad but how did you actually those, get him to understand that initially that like he could be your friend and be safe with you but he couldn't trust other humans i mean that must I, be really hard to get across i i I don't know. It was meant to be is the only thing I can think. But that well, okay, now that gets into I'm not exactly sure if it was within the first year or not, but I told you there was one time that I took off and my two of my brothers followed me. I didn't know they were following me, but oh uh they were on their bike and they wanted to they you know, I would always get asked what I was doing, and it's like getting away from you guys, and yeah. going up there so I don't have to be around you guys. And one time they followed me, and where I got off of the main mountain road and hopped on and, you know, took off on the deer trails, I lost them for a little bit, but, you know, even though they're not as good as I was, I think, but they know enough about tracking and watching for sign that they actually finally – figured out where I was and came to where yeah that that meadow that had that very first one it had my two tree stands the one on the uphill side on the one side and the downhill side on the other side of the meadow that's right. where we were at and they showed up probably about 20 minutes after I pulled up there and I heard bikes coming and you know told him to hide and when my when they showed up, they're asking me, "What are you doing here?" And it's like, "Well, what do you think I'm doing here? Getting stuff set up for this coming hunting season. Staying away from you. What are you doing, following me? I didn't want you to be around you. That type of stuff. And what was? I, I think I told you about this. The situation was kind of weird and. You know, touchy just it from from my standpoint because after they got there and we were talking, and I don't know what it was that he recognized, whether it was scent or what, but he got excited and started to come out and show himself in okay. front of my brothers, and I freaked out and stopped. You know. <clears throat> Did kind of hand signals like, you know, when I tell him to hide and I, you know, do the motion to stay away. And he started coming out and kind of got excited. And there was noise off over in the trees. And my brothers are like, what's that? And I'm like, you know, stay back. And it's like, well, that's why I have my tree stands here. It's because the deer come up from the river all the time. You guys being so loud, you probably ruined my hunting spot for this year because you just now spooked the ones that were over there in the trees. <laughs> but I always wondered. Now, he got excited like he recognized that, that was family to me. I think. I, you know, that I couldn't comm- I couldn't talk like me and you were talking, but, you know, when they showed up and I started talking to him, it's kind of got, I could tell that he was excited and he started to come out from where he was hiding at and I was the one that was like, No, 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 stop, go back and there my brothers are like, What are you doing? And it's like I didn't I get enough of you guys at home, you know, trying to cover up what I was doing, trying to get him to stay hidden. And then that was you know, being harassed by my brothers for the next hour until they finally got bored with harassing me there and then took off again. And then trying to or for the next couple of times that I was up there trying to you know even though yes that's my brothers you don't want even them you can't trust them and that it was then when he understood that I was different I think at that time because I was afraid not him 
I was afraid to get my to let my brothers see him, and that was extremely, I guess, troubling and hard for him to understand because it's my family. Shouldn't they be family to him too? He's, yeah. he's my he's my brother, but now I'm the one that's scared because my brothers are there. And try that point that right there is when I think it finally all clicked that. You can't trust most humans. Yes, there is some that you can. Obviously, I'm here, but it was the fact that I was terrified that my that my brothers were there and were going to see him. It's when that finally hit home to him that yeah, I didn't even trust my brothers with him. You know, and I I still feel that same way right now. That it had it to do over again, I would still act the same way. I wouldn't let my brothers know that he was there. That's, you know, to me, that's troubling that us as humans are like that. That, I mean, it's most of them are so, you know, in that situation that they do want to, well, they do stay hidden. That's, they know how humans are. And that was another thing is how they were harassing me and picking on me there was kicking him off also. And I think seeing how they were, you know, that whole hour that they were there, it was a huge eye-opening or an awakening for him. Mm-hmm. Does that make Does that make sense? Yeah, he got a chance to observe and see how you interact with your brothers, and that they weren't nice to you, and that's yep. why you and, were out in the woods a lot, probably. <laughs> yep. And I didn't want yet yeah, all of that combined it that whole thing then that was hard for him to come to grips with you know it was confusing to him but you know this is family and you don't even want family to see me that and that that actually made the bond between me and him even stronger though Mm -hmm. because of that however whatever it was that he saw and however it was perceived but after that it was even closer between me and him and his daughter that may sound to some people but it that strengthened the friendship that me and him had well maybe he sort of got the feeling that in a way you were kind of an orphan too even though you had a family you couldn't really interact with them and you weren't close yeah. with them. exactly uh, but enough of the down part of it that uh, another kind of funny thing was hairbrush when I first tried to brush his hair I started to say that earlier I don't know why that popped in right there but or why I didn't say it earlier but if you ever get the opportunity make sure it's a, one of the really big hairbrushes that have the bristles far apart and are like you know super stiff and plan on taking three days <laughs> they're worse they're worse than a than a, a sheep dog trying to brush out or a collie or a german shepherd that's shedding their fall coat not that he was shedding but they're trying to comb every square inch well mm-hmm. not every square inch but yeah, that was you funny had, like, too. all kinds of tangles and snarls and burrs and all kinds of crap. Yep, and knots and yeah. and giggles when it giggled. <laughs> it was just... <laughs> oh, that had but... to be fun. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's brush, like it said. Brush we... the Bigfoot, always giggling again. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that and <laughs> well, so now by the end of your first year, let's say let's move it that far forward here. I think you could probably cover most of the stuff did uh you, you, it's going into the fall again, you're back in school um did he understand a lot of English by then? How were you actually communicating at that point uh, there there was a lot that he did, and you know it was words and then more actions but yeah he did understand a lot of words 
you know, uh, when I would say town or, you know, school work, stuff like that, he understood. And buddy, he said buddy all the time. He called me buddy. I called him buddy. That's, well, that's, you know, I'm still in that habit because of that I call. Like when I send you a message, all right, buddy. That, that's the reason why I still to this day call everybody buddy. But it was after, you know, when my brothers followed me up, that's when I realized I needed to move him farther from town. And that's when I started thinking about and working towards getting him deeper in. And in one of the units that uh, isn't a draw unit, like during hunting season, it's one of the units in the back country that is that they didn't draw in and how to get him there and how to get to it and knowing that it was going to take a while. It was after that time that my brothers come up that I started working on trying to get the point across that we needed to move and getting him farther away from town, farther away from people because he was getting bigger, a lot bigger. And did you spend you know, a lot of time with him that summer during your summer vacation or? Yes. Yeah, every, every spare second I had, uh, yeah, usually at the very least one day a week, usually uh, at least, you know, at, at the least one afternoon and on into evening and then back, I'd get back into town late. But I used, I tried to go up there at least for one night, tried for two most of the time. But yeah, it was uh, usually, I think there was only one or two weeks that you know I didn't get a chance to go mm -hmm. and there was a couple of times that I had said that I was going to be there and I wasn't and then next time that I went up it would be you know the same time that I said that I was going to be there the last weekend that I wasn't that I missed so I from that the time that I missed I would make it the exact amount of time is before does that make sense? So yeah. say I said I'd be there in five days and then I missed that day. And I, from that time I'd make it five more days. And it always worked out that when that happened, that worked out fine because I think he thought the same way I was. So he missed this one. So five more days and he'll come up. And I never was able to make it the next day after the day that I had missed. And I, I don't know why I felt like that, but it's like, so I missed this date. So I told him five days and the day that I missed, I would do it five more days from there. And I don't remember if that's something that, that we'd tried to, that I tried to talk about, or if it's just the way that it wound up happening and, it, but it worked or it, it could have been, you know, because I wasn't there, he was waiting for me every single day. Yeah, you don't know because you weren't there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it makes me wonder before you moved him further out in the backcountry if he actually followed you back to town at some point sneakily and got a little I, peek around there at where you were living and who you were living with. I, I had I had wondered if he had come closer to town, but now, knowing what I know now, I wonder if he didn't come down into into town at night and see because there was. Yeah, you know, I can't. I can't say. But there was times that it's like, yeah, it feels like, you know, somebody's outside, and then you go and check, and there's nothing there. But it's like, man, I could have swore that there was somebody. It just seemed like there's somebody outside. You know, that just that feeling that you get. Yeah. And you know, I lived lived in town, but far enough on the outskirts of town that it wouldn't have been too difficult. If he would have followed me down in and knew where I was, because I well, in knowing how. How far in town were you? Like a couple blocks, or? Um. Well, it, from where the last house was, it'd probably be a half a mile. <laughs> but we lived. But you know, the town I lived in, half of the town was in the foothills. Half of the town was yeah. starting up the mountain. This isn't like one house right next to the other. As long as there's any kind of cover or something, they could sneak in easily. It would have been easy if he would have followed me in. It would have been easy for him to 
dodge in and out of cover, especially as quick as they can move, and make it all the way from, you know, the last, you know, down out of the foothills, down through town, he could have probably got there, you know, just in a matter of minutes, darting in and out of, you know, the cover between houses, or, you know, from house to house, or, you know, trees to trees, you know, not any huge forest in town, but there would be enough cover, you know, the creek bed, follow the creek, one of the three creeks through town, he'd be able to, you know, move through there. I've seen some of these little towns before, too, you know, and it's like they practically roll up the sidewalks when it gets dark. And, uh, you know, they're just, uh, just, some of these towns don't have much of a nightlife. You go through there at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's a ghost town. You don't see anybody. Yeah, the one stoplight starts flashing at 7 p.m. There you go. Yeah. And there's only, uh, what is the, the whole town was, you know, there's only the police and criminals out after dark. <laughs> and big <Bigfoot. laughs> <laughs> That's it. back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Once again, we're having another part of the Glag Saga. This will be number three. And last time, if you recall, we talked about how after he had met Glag initially, he was worried about him. He was trying to get in better uh, communication skills worked up with him. They were playing in uh, Sasquatch soccer and uh, a bunch of other stuff happened, including some close calls and his brothers actually trailing him, following up to uh, where he was uh, meeting with Glag, and uh, pretty alarming. So he's uh, apparently, at this point, decided that something needs to be done about that. But before we get on to that, uh, let's catch up with the rest of the stuff that happened. Well, you know, that it, how rural it was is, you know, there would be deer come down right through the middle of town on their way to the river when it was in the middle of winter. Right. You know, there's deer tracks in the snow through the front yard so it's not like you know it's not like dallas texas you know this is you know right in the middle of town you've got you know in any direction you know maybe a mile and a half two miles and you can be back into the thick of it yeah and as far as animals wandering into human settlements you know we've got I've got five deer that live in my backyard every winter, so it's, yeah. and I'm, uh, you know, a good uh, mile into town here probably. There's deer all over the place here. So for some that can, that's that stealthy and they can move fast, going a few blocks into some little town in the middle of the night is not going to be even really much of a challenge. Yep, and anybody... You know, anyway, everybody the reason else, I, I know yeah. I'm just kind of like making a mountain out of a molehill here, but the point I'm trying to get at is maybe it wasn't the smell of your brothers. Maybe he had actually seen them before and recognized them. Yeah, well, like I said, now knowing what I know now, that wouldn't surprise me. But back then is when I didn't, you know, it was, you know, it, I wondered what did he recognize on why he was, right. you know, excited that they were there. But <laughs> that could totally be what it is knowing what I know now I wouldn't wouldn't and surprise it could be their scent. Did it could be their scent, you know it could be their scent too it could be it could be either one I'm not trying to steer you into deciding that's what what caused it or anything but you know knowing how stealthy and sneaky they are it wouldn't surprise me at all you know like you're his only companionship and you keep yeah. leaving all the time and it would not surprise me if he trailed you back at some point to see where it was you were living yeah, and well, and that's why I say you know it wouldn't surprise me one bit. You know, it's something I never thought of back then. But the reason I went up as much as I could is I didn't want him to be alone. But now knowing, you know, how far they can move and how far they will travel in a night, and him coming to town to watch me in town is yeah nothing. Even though it'd yeah. take me a from where he was at, you know, that first year on my bike, it'd take me a little over an hour to get there. It probably took him a quarter of that time to get get back to town. 
<laughs> I don't know if you ever thought about this, but when you left left him to go back to town, he might have been sitting there on the edge of town waiting for you to get there. <laughs> <laughs> or the reason he always was right there waiting for me is he saw me coming through town and run up to the spot. Yeah. Because he didn't have to follow the, he didn't have to follow the road. He could cut, you know, cross country right, and make woods. it up there quicker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all terrain. Pussies yeah. don't even stop them. They go over anything. <laughs> yep. It, you know, it, I hadn't thought of it, you know, it's just now when you said that it's like it doesn't surprise me one bit if he did, but I had never thought of that back then and I don't know why I hadn't well, I just hadn't thought about it until now yeah. but well and the other thing is with some of these uh encounters and stuff when you when you share them with somebody else they'll have insights into it that maybe you never thought of which gives you some more insight into the whole experience that you had and you know maybe right maybe wrong but at least it gives you a chance to think about it a little bit differently and go well let me consider this possibility and i've had that you know with my encounters where I was telling some part of it to somebody, and they came up with something, and I just went, whoa, I never even thought about that possibility. Oh, that's really great. Well, and that's what gets to, I heard, you know, people's stories of encounters of, you know, being 20, 25 miles away and have one of these things follow them home. Mm-hmm. And up until just now, I had never thought of that. You know, in my instance, I just always assumed that, you know, that, when I we'd made the plan for me to go back, that he well, was right there waiting. Like not only just not only possible, but probable. I mean, you're yep. his best friend. You're the only thing he's got to interact with, and you're taking off. Well, gee, I want to go see where my best friend's going. And, and man, he knows where you're I just from. wonder if man, there's that kid. It it, it it could it opens up a whole world of possibilities that I had never thought about, but. Yeah, it's my way of thinking it'd be kind of weird if he didn't try to follow you at some point yeah, to see where well, you were going. Thinking about it just now, it, yeah, it would be. But, you know, that again, that gets back to where I was still a kid. But what he'd see is me go home and endure what I endured at home and then working. And then, I, you know, did he watch me go to school? Did he watch me work? Did he, you know, I mean, did he see all of that with his own eyes? And then when I got up there and it was. When I got up there is when I was the happiest. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, that just that makes it even that much more powerful to me if he did. If he did, and which, in all probability, he did. Well, Kerry is smart, stealthy, and nothing but time to go sneak around in. So he, he doesn't have a he doesn't have, have, have to be to school. He doesn't have a summer vacation. No. His uh, he hasn't got a job. And the other. Uh, it brings up the other thing about moving him was, you know, there's that, I told you there's a couple of times in the beginning, it was all around the same time about the end of the first year when it looked like he'd just been beat up. And when I'd asked, you know, you know, try to get him to, you know, try to find out what happened and he just didn't really want to talk about it. And I think it was, the other ones that were in the general area that didn't like the fact that him and I were buddies. That's that's what I thought back then. And it was all of that combined. And when my brothers went up and it was after that time that it just looked like you'd been in a tussle, you know, more than just us wrestling around in the, in the trees. It just concerned me because he just didn't even want to really not talk, but, you know, he didn't want to, deal with what what had happened to him what it came across was you know what my brothers always did to me is what was happening to him and see i'd never thought about that as you know what the impression that i got from what little bit of communication we had about why he looked like he'd been roughed up a bit was you know my brothers did that kind of stuff to me and it was kind of the impression that i got was same thing happened to him that time and that's when i seriously started about thinking about moving him away from there and then all the problems of okay where do i go that he's not going to run into you know the bullies that are you know going to rough him up like that for me being around and 
finding a good place that's away from, you know, the humans that are going to bother him. And then that's what also me wanting to teach him how to defend himself. That's another thing. That's the human side. Me being a kid, wanting to teach him how to fight like a human, not understanding that if me and him were to get in a fight, <laughs> there, there wouldn't be anything. He wouldn't need to know how to fight to massacre a human. He can just go plank mm-hmm. with his middle finger and you're done. Yeah. But teaching him how to punch like, you know, I had learned how to punch. You know, I think I told you, I don't think I've said on the air, but I've been in martial arts for a long time because of, you know, the way my brothers had treated me. So I started trying to teach him. <laughs> it sounds funny trying to. Well, had you now wait, let's back up a little bit now. How, when did you become aware that there was another troop of Bigfoot in this area? It was it was all around. That's what I'm getting at. Is all around the same time as when I saw him look like he'd been roughed up. Is when I what realized did you think there was, it was more Bigfoot, and that he didn't just like have a fight with a mountain lion or a bear or something like that. Yeah, well, that I didn't know what had happened, but I had asked him. You know, was it? I asked, was it a mountain lion? Was it? Was it an animal? Another animal? Was it? And he just. It's kind of hard to explain. He just didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to explain it. And it wasn't like he had, didn't see, like, claw marks, like from a bear or a mountain lion. Right. You know, no gore marks from a from a deer, you know, antlers or anything. It just looked like, you know, spots of hair had been ripped out, you know, and just looked, you know, parts of his skin were darker than the other, which I took as bruises. Uh-huh. And... That's when I, I asked, is it, was it some of your people that did this? Said, was it other, other people like you that did this to you? And he just, he just wanted to, wanted to build a fire and eat. And all, it's all he kept doing that night was he just wanted to eat and forget about it. And that's where the lack of communication. I never actually knew exactly what happened, but that's what I thought, and that made a lot of sense to me in the fact that. You know, whenever I'd go to sleep when I was up in there and I realized that he wasn't really sleeping, he was just watching Mm -hmm. or, you know, protecting, you know, that's when I told you that's when it, you know, made our bond even more so because when I went to sleep, he had to make sure that I was protected. He watched over me when I was asleep and I'm starting to get choked up again. Wow. Right. So, how long have you been doing martial arts then? How how young were you when you started learning that? No, I was. Uh, I think I was ten, nine or ten when I started. So I was. I was already. I you're you're pretty playing. good already. Yeah, you're pretty good by the time you run into Clag. Well, I I had to be. I had four older brothers that I needed to defend myself against, and my. My instructor understood that also, and he helped out with that aspect of it. Sorry about that. That just, I mean, there's some of it that, when it comes back, it just brings back that flood of emotions too. Yeah. No problem, buddy. <clears throat> What's well, the martial arts? What did you learn anyway? Yeah, I learned a keto art of self defense. <laughs> Well, keto doesn't have a whole lot of punches and kicks in it. That's mostly tossing things around. So you would think uh, that'd be pretty ideal for something like a Sasquatch. It's big enough to like a keto throw an elephant. Yeah, uh, using using uh, somebody else's massive size against them. Yeah. Yep. And so you know, and somebody trying to hurt you, you know, turning it around on them. So it was interesting. It was <laughs> hilarious. How and the then, hell did you teach him stuff like this? How did you get across to him that you were trying to teach him how to defend himself? Uh, he was my buddy. I, it's uh, one of them, in that situation, it, it seemed natural, but trying to explain to you how I got it across that we were going to, you know, I told him, you know, you don't ever let any, I said, you don't ever, you know, back down from anybody. If somebody wants to hurt you, you hurt them back. 
which, you know, thinking about it now, that's, you know, like I said, as a kid, you know, seeing my buddy get his butt whooped, I didn't want that to happen and knew what it felt like to get my butt kicked. And I wanted to teach him how to defend himself. Knowing what I know now, all I did was probably make him more, he had the tools already, just giving you know, how to the instruction manual. Go ahead. Yep. Give it to him. Well, the, I know how that how to grasp the concept of a clenched fist and throwing a punch. You know, have a that's something that I did teach him is how to throw an actual punch instead of a hammer fist. Mm-hmm. Which was terrifying, the p- amount of power that he could get in a swing. Well, how did you show him that a punch was better than a hammer fist? How did you get that? Well, on, uh, what was it? I think it was a bunch of pine boughs first. And then, you know, set them up, tied them together with a bunch of twine, and then, you know, did a hammer fist, and then did a punch. But then he held out his hand and, you know, gently popped him, you know, did a hammer fist in the palm of his hand, and then did it with some did a closed fist with the knuckles, you know, not hard, not enough right. to hurt, but said, well, you know, and then, as if you could hurt him anyway, seriously, come yeah. on. But, but I, I knew the strength that was behind there and didn't want him, you know. And you didn't want to shock but, him or something. Yeah, just, but then show him and then, you know, a do kata and show him that, you know, how I would throw a punch and he'd, started mimicking, you know, when I do cut it, you know, that's, you know, your exercises, yep. my, your horse, and, and then, you know, when sh- show instead of, you know, you know, beating something down with a hammer fist, you know, throw a punch, and a punch produces more power. But did you notice it's, the difference? How, 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 do, you, the open how do I explain what was going through my head, even? Here I am trying to teach <laughs> Well, well just take what you know. Explain what what his reaction was. Start with the you you got him to hold his hand up and you hammer fist it and then you punch it. Did he notice a difference? Oh yeah, the the look of shock and the open in his eyes. I mean, when he looked up at me, he looked me in the eyes like you know that was instant when you noticed it like that and that just even just barely touching you know barely punching you you can feel that the difference in, you know, the thud and then the snap or the crack of hitting with the knuckles. And that was and, the aha moment. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's, this I mean, is when it, learning. it didn't, you know, he didn't need words. You could see in his eyes and the look is like, holy cow, that's, you know, there's night and day difference, even though, you know, maybe what, 15, 20% punch in a, 45% hammer fist, and the punch is, you know, you can feel it in the palm of your hand, how much more power it had, how much more it hurt. Yeah. And then, you know, we always shadow box, you know, not at each other, but, you know, showing uppercut, and it, it sounds so goofy, but it, to me at the time... It's like I'm trying to picture Karate Kid out in the woods teaching to, teaching Bigfoot. <laughs> And the, the thing is, is that their bodies are built a little bit different than ours. So try, I'm trying to imagine him doing, like, my God, if one of those things punches you, it'd be even way worse than being hit by a human the same size and strength. Because yep. your arms are longer. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, when you throw a punch, you put your body weight into it. Can you imagine now he knows how to punch and make it hurt? If another Bigfoot come up, I wanted him to be able to hurt it and not his butt kicked. I wanted him to be able to be, you know, now I know I was teaching him how to beat an alpha male if it ever came to that. But he was my buddy. That's what I wanted. Yeah. I didn't think uh, of it then. I just wanted him to be able to defend himself the best way he could, which, you know, with his, you know, his innate or his natural ability and his natural strength, he can defend himself pretty well. But yeah, well, I wanted you know, him to have again, it's advantage. not just a, it's not just it's a combination of three things. It's mass, strength, and speed, and he's got all three. And now yep. you're giving him the technique. 
Like, he could crush a, a Mack truck with a punch. It's ridiculous, dude. Yeah, well, I know that now. I didn't know I wanted him. <laughs> I know you weren't thinking of that when you were, like, 16 teaching him that. But let me just say in retrospect, shame. Shame on you. Shame. And and also, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, you know, I told you, it's jumping ahead a little bit, but, you know, would somebody, you know, <laughs> about what has been heard up there, you know, the the human words that he can say, but oh, you know, when yeah, you're mad at somebody ahead. and you tell this him... This would be probably a good time to mention this, that somebody else may have actually run into him. Yes, because I don't, I don't want to say what I taught him, <laughs> because it, it's, it's not bad, but it's bad when... Is somebody, you know, out there squatching, you know, hunting for Bigfoot, you know, figures out that there's something there and, you know, like tracking it and stuff. And I told him to, uh, what is the word, it taught him to say screw you, but not screw you. <laughs> Fire truck. Yes. Yeah, vacuum. You know, vacuum the rug. Yeah. But anyway, and, the audience has got it, so. And that has been heard uh, within the last uh, three or four years. Now, just imagine if I was in the woods right now, knowing what I know, that would still terrify me if I was to hear that come out of the woods at me. <laughs> yeah, especially considering how deep and loud their voice is. What is there? Is there like a dragon over there that's mad at me? I'm leaving the state now. I'm done. That's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> Oh, mercy. It's perfect, though. I mean, that's exactly what I wanted was him to be able to scare people away so they'd stay away from him and leave him alone. Uh, well, I would imagine if he uh, if he uh, if he's still around, he's probably the alpha of whatever truth that he's hanging around with. That. Uh, I hope so. That's that what kind I... of training and that kind of feeding. Uh, yeah, I don't know if a standard squat can kill the hook bite, something like that. Well, like I said, last show, you know, that first couple of years, I, we fumbled our way through and somehow made it. You know, all the, you know, what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do, I, I messed up every way possible with him, but it was a different situation than almost nine uh, you know a hundred percent of encounters mine was i encountered a young one that didn't have mama or daddy right over there in the in the trees protecting him it you know a totally 100 percent unique situation yeah and you know if you choose not to believe it anymore i i don't care but hopefully the people that that if you believe me, maybe you can get something out of it. And if at anything, it's like with people, what I want people to get from it is there's good ones and there's bad ones. And it's not, they're all not, you know, what it is. They ain't all not, the same. They're just like humans. Some of them are nice, some of them are mean. Yeah. And it now, doesn't matter if you're an Indian human or a black human or a white human or an Asian human. Some of them are nice, some of them are mean. Yeah. And some of them pray to God you never meet, but they don't all, you know, they're not all monsters. Right. Even there's a very, uh, what's the word? I mean, they're family oriented. Yeah. Just because they're not, you know, a white family or a black family or a brown family like us, they're a hairy family. But no. they're still yeah, a family. I, they're, they're still a mother and a father and children the fact that humans are a conundrum you know humans horrify them i think you know yeah, there's the squabbles over food and stuff but still as a as a family unit or as a whole i, I think they treat each other better than humans treat each other well they're, you know from what i understand they don't like murder each other and stuff although they'll have wars with other troops but no. they have you know better there's better no there's no cold-blooded murder no there's 
that's what we hear anyway. You know, we'll wait until we find out something different. But from what I, everything that I've heard, they just they don't do that. If they're the closest they'll come to something like that is if one of them's given away their position and can't be stopped, or uh, you know, one of them so critically wounded they ain't gonna survive it, they'll just kill it. But yeah, that's more like a mercy killing than it is. Like yeah, survival of the family or the group yeah. Yeah. is more important Probably than we want. the individual. Yeah, and uh, uh, I was gonna just comment on something that I heard Cat say, but go ahead. It it yeah, I, it's what I'm trying to think of. Well, you know the the lying thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not even a concept that they grasp, and you know, look at how many look look at how bad humans lie about everything. Yeah, with them, that's not even anything that they can they can conceive of. It's not even in their thought process. A lie is just totally foreign to them. Wouldn't it be nice if humans didn't lie? Yeah. Yep. Yipper. 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 That's for sure. And the, the more powerful they are, the more they lie all the time. Lies, lies, yeah. lies. Well, it, I hope that this one answered a few more questions. That wasn't super exciting, but you know, it's just. <laughs> Definitely. Well, you got to get all the basic details in. It's not like we're looking for a super exciting story here. We want to hear what actually happened. With yeah. your the, encounters with this guy they, if, all the time. If they're folks spending. have anything they want to know specifically, that would, you know, I can answer, try to answer, you know, specific questions. Hopefully yeah. that. Just throw her in the comments, folks. Um, so it was kind of like after the first year is when you ended up moving him elsewhere. Yeah, a deeper into the backcountry because he was, you know, fairly close to town when, you know, I first met him and for that first year, he's, that's where where we always met was, you know, not that far from town. And then that's when I uh, wanted to move him farther away and that was an adventure in and of itself. Oh, yeah. Uh, how many times did you have to go, how the heck did you manage to pick a spot where you figured, you know, obviously you can look at where they're going to be pulling licenses to go hunting and then go, okay, this area, there's not going to be any hunters and generally there's no backpackers here. But then how do you know that there's not some rival troop there that he's going to have to deal with? That's where I kind of relied on him. I had, I, you know, would, would he go with you when you went general on general direction and having scouts? Oh, so he went with you when you did these recon missions? Yeah, yeah. Well, he actually went when I'd suggest, you know, a spot, you know, we'd go up on top of the mountain and I'd point to an area and, you know, because there's there's that creek that runs down through there. Look, there's a meadow there. There's, you know, that outcropping of rocks that looks like that might be a good spot. You want to check that out. And when I come back on this day, we can go look at it together. And that got into some pretty exciting times. The stuff that might people might find interesting that went on in those adventures. Well, we'll tell that in the next part of the story where you and Glag are running around looking for a new place to move him to. Yep. Getting further away from the uh, annoying humans and apparently unfriendly Sasquatch troop that was in that area. Yep. And that that's the thing that, you know, back then as, as a kid is I got the impression they didn't want him being friends with me, you know, hanging around with me, you know, as a kid would say, but yet they wouldn't take him. I don't think they, I think they rejected him when he was, you know, when that happened to his mother and father, but now that he's getting older and I, you know, he's friends with me. Now they don't want him to be friends with me. You know, it's like, you know. Well, I can, you can tell how that wouldn't fly very well with him. It's like, you know, you're not giving me any options here. I've only got one friend, and you want to take that friend away from me, and you're not allowing me to be part of your troop. Screw you guys. Yep. And that's why I wanted him, you know, I was trying to move him away from everything. Yeah. You know, away from them, away from humans, anything that could hurt him, because, you know, like I told you just, 30 minutes ago, I'd never thought about, you know, that maybe he'd come to town to follow me and watch me, but then now I realize that when I moved him farther in, it wasn't I was getting him away from the troop that 
wouldn't accept him. I'm putting him into a totally different troop area. Mm. I didn't realize that then. Yeah, that well, gets you know, into that. It's, yeah, it's in the area he was in. It sounds like they weren't going to take him anyway, so it didn't really matter if he was moved to another place. And there was at least a flip of the coin whether they'd ever accept him or not. And sounds like the other ones weren't gonna. Yep. And I was just trying to find a spot that was free of other Sasquatch and not realizing that they're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I just and moved him into a different troop, and it, it was a gamble. Now I know it was a gamble as whether or not he's going to survive there, but I think because he was a tough SOB is why he was able to stay where we moved him to. Well, and probably, you know, at that point, uh, he's out there by himself, solo Sasquatch, uh, you know, still like a teenager or something. Or that one event that happened, that can be in the next one yeah. that happened after we moved. Right. Well, next time we'll we'll get everybody up to date about all your adventures and trying to find a place to move to. God, that must have taken a while. I'm sure it was more than one try. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, fun at least. It's like, oh, well, let's me and my friend Sasquatch will go over here and explore this area, and I'll feel very, feel very confident and safe while we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that gets back into how I we fumbled our way through all of that. Just every mistake you could make, I made, but somehow we got through it. Man. And anybody, if there's anything that specific they want to know, you know, Ask the you know they can post in the comments and next time you can tell me what they what they want to know if there's something specific they want me to hit on. By all means, you know, and everybody's listening to this. If you got questions, go ahead post them in the comment section, and I'll make sure that he hears about it. Okay, well, are we uh, we pretty much covered that first year up to the point where you're getting ready to move them? Then was there anything else that we missed? Um, not that I can think of at the moment. You. Give me something else to contemplate about, you know, what we talked about tonight. I had never thought of that. that. <laughs> well, I'll give you something to think about over the next couple of weeks. I know it's like sometimes that stuff just hits you. It's like somebody that uh, had an experience and they go and they, they look online and get all this information on Bigfoot. And then they start going, oh, my God, I may have actually, like, been around these things a bunch of times. And just not even realized because I didn't know what I was what was going on around me, what I was seeing, what I was hearing, smelling, et cetera. And then I get really freaked out. <laughs> yeah, so well, it, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You can all of a sudden connect up the dots and go, Whoa, this could have been what's going on and I never even thought about that. Yeah, that's what I what I mean. The man that oh, that makes you know, it makes no sense if he didn't. Yeah. And that just brings up something that I had never even never even crossed my mind and it's like holy cow that man there's there's so much that yeah and you got to figure with these guys they are like the king of fast and sneaky and mobility and he can go cross country you know like 15 minutes he's sitting down by town waiting for you to come riding in in yeah. another half hour <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah, I know that what I'm getting at is I never, never even crossed my mind. And now, knowing what I know, it's pretty much a guaranteed that he did. I just never even thought about it. And again, you know, that uh, it's it, – I almost lean more toward it was the smell of your brothers that brought him out. But if he uh, never got a close look at you – know, I mean, he may have followed you back to where you live or something at that point and never really seen any interaction between you and your brothers. And that was yeah. the first time he actually saw the interaction and went, whoa, they're not friendly. What's up with yeah. that? Yep. That, that so, still, you know, he I may have actually recognized him but didn't really know how you guys interacted or it may be just like you were thinking that he just smelled them. But, yep. you know, I would think the chances would be really high that at some point he followed you back at least close to where it is that you live to see where it was because, yep. you know, even a human that was in that position would want to do that. Yeah, yeah, but make the situation reverse. I'd, I'd want to. Yeah, you'd want to figure out where your friend was living that had a family that kept coming and visiting you yeah. and trying to help yeah. you. You'd go, well, where are they coming from? 
and I yeah. can't go to. I need to go. I'm going to go find out. And it's not like Bigfoot are curious or anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not like they, they wear their daytime soaps. Yeah, we're their nighttime show. Let's go watch the Johnson family dinner before we go hunting. Oh, I love that show. Let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Well, it's always fun talking about stuff like this because, you know, again, even with your long, long experience and interaction with this guy, things like this can come up that you never even thought about, and then it can help you, like, put other pieces of the puzzle together and go, oh, maybe that's what was going on sort of thing, you know. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I, I've i learned about Bigfoot has been just this way, talking to people that have had experiences with them and getting their information on what happened in their situation. And then you start seeing the same kind of information popping up over and over and over again that starts looking like there's a pretty good case for fill in the blank is what's happening here because <laughs> it seems to be happening all the time, you know. Yep. But yeah, that's you know that stuff is all. It's very interesting and it's just fascinating to have people that are willing to come forward that have had interaction with these things come forward and talk about it. Um, uh, it's, really, it's still it's still you know hard for me to talk about. It, there's still that you know I, I'm glad I'm doing it. It helps, but you know what am I trying to get at? It's still difficult to talk about. You know, first off. You know, there's always back in the back of your mind, you know, you can say you don't care what people think, but everybody does. Yeah. But that's why I told you thanks for what the people like you do that give, you know, the people like me an outlet to come and say what I've seen, what I've witnessed, what I've been through. It just, it, it helps so much to talk about it. I know I don't think people that haven't been there can really appreciate just how important that is because I had my encounter for 40 years before I even told anybody about it, and uh, it was like a huge weight was lifted off me. As soon as I could tell somebody that didn't ridicule me, that was a huge relief. Exactly, and that was the reason why I kept it in for so long is because of being afraid of you know, turning into the town drunk. Yeah. Yeah, and that was really, uh, you know, sort of like terrible timing for you, too, to have that fresh in your mind about what happened to the town drunk and then have this experience and go, oh, God, I don't want to be the town drunk. What do I do? Yeah, uh, exactly, and that's always, you know, in the back of my mind, is that going to happen? And, you know, that's what I, you know, when I said, you know, it's so refreshing that the general consensus has changed. You know, it's not instantly you say that you've seen a Sasquatch or even that you believe in them and you're not just ridiculed relentlessly by everybody like it was, you know, in the 70s and 80s. Oh, God, back then you couldn't tell anybody anything about Bigfoot or you'd just be run out of town on a, a flaming rail and tarred and feathered and thrown in a ditch. Yeah. And that was if you're in the Pacific Northwest. You better not really say anything about it if you're outside that area. You know, yep. at least you were in Idaho where they like you could maybe get somebody to believe there was such a thing as Bigfoot. But like I was in northern Minnesota, dude, there's no Bigfoot there. No, what are you talking about? You're crazy. No, those things aren't around here. Yeah, that's over there in Roger Patterson land over uh, California or something, isn't it? No, that's where that stuff's happening. There's no Bigfoot around here. And so there was like uh, you know, some of these people you hear from the deep south that lived out in the hollers and the hills and stuff. And, well, grandpappy knew the boogers were around. And my dad knew about them, too. And my uncle told me about them. And I, you know what? Nobody around where I live knew dick about these things. Nobody talked about them. Nobody shared their stories with me. Nobody said anything about them. So I'm really glad that you guys down south had people to tell you about this because we didn't have nothing up north. We had to figure it out on our own or get eaten. Yeah. Well, you know, it. It was known about. It just might not have been talked about. You know, the boogeyman. Yeah. No, that, it wasn't known about there at all. The only people that had any idea that it existed were the natives, and they don't talk about it. Yeah. None of the northern European transplants that lived there or were born there knew anything about it. But, well, more towards the south, like the boogers, the booger man. 
Booger Man's gimme. Yeah, that's down in the south though. That was fifteen hundred yeah. miles from where I was. Yeah. I don't know what's going on up there. I was up in the tundra, man. I was up by the Canadian border. Yep. And yeah, they knew all about the Wendigo up there if you happen to be a native and other than that, they weren't telling the white man anything about it. Mm. Yep. You just get eaten by Wendigo, stupid white man. Ha ha ha. If they if they warn you about them, then uh, you don't get eaten by it. Yeah, well, yeah, see, there you go. But, uh, you know, yeah, northern Minnesota, very dangerous. Definitely Bigfoot there. I've heard dogman sightings. I've seen Wendigo there. There's cryptids there. Well, it's a huge area, 30,000 lakes, and in between there's swamps and forests. There's some areas like where uh, the Minnesota Ice Man supposedly was shot was up in the white face. Well, the white face is surrounded by a swamp. You have to use a swamp buggy to even get there. The only time you can get there is during the winter, otherwise when it's frozen. And, you know, and this is what the areas are like. And like, oh, there couldn't be any big foot. You can't even get in there. How do you know what's in there? Shut up. Exactly. <laughs> I am just and that was the so same place glad I that ran I... in the mine. It was the middle of nowhere. The only time you could get there in the winter when everything was frozen, during the spring, summer, and fall, you literally could not get to where we went to. So, yeah, you know, it's like uh, there was just no recognition of this sort of thing being anything like remotely related to possibly existing back in those days. And even if you're on the Pacific Coast, you know, and out in the area where at least some of the natives and locals and stuff knew about Bigfoot, if you talked to, like, anybody in a even mid-sized town or anything about Bigfoot, you were still crazy. Yep. So, yeah. That's what I, I mentioned last time also is I guarantee you that probably half the people, you know, within 100 miles of my hometown had had some type of encounter but were too afraid to say anything about it. I guarantee you I wasn't the only one in the town drunk wasn't the only one that had ever seen one up there. No. I got it's another just, uh, guest coming on from Libby, which isn't that far away from here. It's up in northern Montana. Mm-hmm. And sort of a similar setup there. You know, they got a little town. It's a logging town, da-da-da-da-da. And everybody up there pretty much knows Bigfoot is real. They just want to talk about it to outsiders, yep. which is another weird twist on the same thing. So, yeah, you know, just because you don't hear anything coming out of these little towns doesn't mean that there's nothing going on. It just means that they're not telling you about it. That's what it really means. All right. Well, we got a few uh, questions from the fans to ask you here, or the listeners. They want to know a few different things that you didn't touch on yet. And, of course, some of these things may be in upcoming parts of the story. If that's okay, you know, don't worry about it. If it is, go ahead answer the question. You can go over it again later on anyway. Um, and one of the odder questions was, what color was the inside of his mouth? Kind of light gray to pinkish, not like the inside of ours, meaning humans, but not as dark as his skin. Okay. Was his just, tongue that color too, or just the inside of his mouth? Uh, yeah, it was all about the same color. Okay. Well, a couple, that is kind of uh, odd and something I didn't ever think about. But Yeah, that's not a question I was expecting either, and it's not one that, well, you know, nobody ever really mentions that part of it. Even if they see the thing, yell at him or something, it's like, who's actually close yeah, enough to look inside very, of his mouth? Uh, very good question, though. Yeah. Now, another one that I have that occurred to me is you were saying that you, you found him a cave to stay in, and when you'd go take a nap there, you were under the impression that, he probably wasn't sleeping. He was probably keeping the lookout all night long. Did he ever, like, make himself like a Sasquatch-type nest in there? Did he have anything else that he had drug in the cave? Was there, like, really any, you know, evidence that he was using it when you weren't there? Yes. Uh, after, yeah, like I said, I thought that's where he had already been staying. And mm-hmm. there was pine boughs and sticks and branches and all sorts of stuff piled in there and Kind of like a little little tunnel that you had to crawl through to get in there. You had to get down to get through the entrance back into the little opening back there. But then there was uh, not like your typical structure because it was in a cave and it wasn't a you know a huge deep cave. It was just more like a recess down in the rocks. Mm-hmm. But he had yeah there was uh, pine boughs and stuff in there in the bottom that it, it already looked like he had been 
kind of nesting, for lack of a better term. But then the wool blank moving blankets is what was put down over top of that, and it always, you know, it acted like a windbreak, and it just looked like a bunch like of kind brush. Of had that kind of it. The, it, it, yeah, at the, the entrance there with all that brush in it would be a windbreak, plus it would help hide it too, so that was pretty clever. Exactly, and that's something he had already done, but it had always looked like it had been uh, freshened up, you know, when stuff would start getting old and dried out, new fresher stuff would get packed, piled in front of it. And it was just and, mostly all like pine boughs and stuff is what he was, was using yeah, for it? Yeah, well, because of and sagebrush and stuff like that, you got to remember this is a pine forest, no deciduous trees at all. Right. And if you did, if you didn't know where it was, you could probably walk right by it and never know that it recessed back in there as far as it did. And that was be hidden pretty good. Yep. Yeah, I can I can definitely see the uh positive aspects of hiding the entrance to your little hidey hole. <laughs> yeah. Well the other question that comes up then, did you ever actually see him sleep? Very good question. And you know, I don't think I ever did, ever. I, oh, you know, I rest, rest, rested a bunch, but I think it was so exciting when I was there that he wanted to, man, he had to tucker me out. He wanted to <laughs> be up and doing something all the time, and that's what I said when go down in there and rest, and I'd fall asleep. I don't think he ever did. I don't think, you know, like I said, an excellent question. I don't think I ever saw him actually sleep sleep. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. He was probably worried about you and trying to make sure that you were safe the whole time you were out there with him. And that <laughs> now, now that because I'm, he was aware of some other threats that were around the area, which is kind and, of disconcerting. And that is, now that I'm older and know what I know, that actually scares the crap out of me. But I realized that that was probably going on. And at the time, thank goodness I didn't, because yeah, if I would have had to, if I would have thought about that and worried about that back then, yeah, I don't, I don't know how how good it would have went. But. <laughs> it would have been Panic City. I don't know if you would have been out there that much. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that gets into that gets into something that we'll talk about in a different episode, other than tonight. But what you just touched on, and we talked about off the air before. That I'll get into in one of the next episodes that gets into that. Yep, another cliffhanger, guys. Sorry, got to deal with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another thing that comes up here is you said when you first ran into him, he was sort of depleted the the local area of bunny rabbits and easy to catch small game and stuff like that. Did you ever get to see him hunt and catch anything? Um, no, but I got to see after he had caught something. You so never got to actually see him older. hunting, but yeah, he would come in with some game occasionally or something. Yeah. Yes, as as he started getting older later on, yeah, I I didn't have to provide for him anymore. You know, one question that came up is was he, you know, was he happy to see you when you showed up, or did it just become like, oh yeah, Kevin's here again? And I, I already answered that one for you and went, uh, no, he was like super thrilled every time Kevin showed up. Every every single time it was like Christmas Day. Every yeah. single time, and which was made it made me want to go up there even more because of the enthusiasm and the how excited he was to see me, and vice versa, how excited I was to get up there and get away and be with my buddy. Right on. I could see that definitely. That makes sense to me. Now, by the time um, you guys, you know, had spent like let's say you. I know this is going to be probably hard for you to remember, but at the end of the first year that you've been interacting with him, how much, how many words in English did he actually know that he could like say to you? Oh, mercy. Quite a few. So ballpark um, at 20 not, words, 50 words, 100 words, 200 words? 75 to 100. Okay, so that's pretty good for one year. So he knew... He not only understood a lot of words, but there was a smattering of English words that he could speak to yeah. and knew what they meant. Yeah, he tried. He tried to say motorcycle all the time, but 
That that one too many syllables. <laughs> he said he said bike pretty good. I said it's just my bike. You can call it my bike. <laughs> and motorcycle, and, you know, fire. Uh, he, he had more than just words, like uh, simple phrases, like you know, me do it whenever he <laughs> want to want to try something. Me do it because uh, I'd always say, do you want to do it? And, and then you get all excited. Let me do it. Me do it. Me, yep, exactly. And I remember like the more to do excited the he got. Yep, and the more excited he got, the faster he'd start talking. It's like, leg, leg, slow down, slow down. <laughs> the point where you couldn't understand what the hell he was saying. Yep. <laughs> Another interesting question here that came up is, did you ever have, I know this is with limited language, it would have been almost really, really tough to do this, but did you ever have, like, any kind of philosophical discussion with him? Did you ever mention God or anything like that? Um, I saw that in one of the comments, and... Yes, as odd as that sounds, I was raised religious, and I would pray a bunch, and he would – never had like a discussion about it, but whenever I'd pray, he'd always do the exact same thing I did. I mean, he'd always uh, – how, how do I explain that? The reverence that I showed from my creator, he did too. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you with, like teach him how to pray or anything like that, or did he have like his own way of doing it? That that it was never something that we like discussed. It's just he, when I'd pray, it's like he already knew what I was doing. If that makes sense, that you know, whenever I'd say a prayer over a meal, which you know was, I tried to do it. I still try to do it every time. And just it's something I've done my whole life. I hope that's making sense. It's it's, it's like he knew what I was doing. And, Didn't that strike you, know, you as kind of odd though that you could like pray and here's this forest guy kid that still seemed to know what you were doing? Well, that's what always made me think that he wasn't an animal. Yeah, he was. Well, he there's was, atheist humans though too. Yeah. It, yes. But it, but see that again is where me being so young also, it's not something I pondered on. I have thought about that as I got older, but back then it was just that's kind of cool, you know. And uh, what would you do you when know, you pray? Would you like bow to your head and just uh, pray silently, or hold your hands and pray out loud, or how are you doing it? Yeah, I I just I just say a quick prayer. Dear Lord, thanks for this food that we're about to receive, help it to, you know, but it was always out loud. I just bow my head and bless the food real quick. And a lot of times I'd say a prayer before bed. And it, you know, like I said, it's not something that was ever discussed. It's just like he understood what I was doing. Yeah, again, that's it's, just it, like, you know, kind of. Uh, you know, nobody really touches on the spiritual aspect of Bigfoot, and I'm sure most people assume there isn't one. And I just find it, you know, interesting that apparently he did understand what it was you were doing. Yep. And that's where I wish, you know, I could go back in time with the knowledge I have now of, in, in the wisdom of many, many, many more years. And because, well... If I did that, I don't think I would have done anywhere near as much as I did back then. Like I said, we stumbled and fumbled our way through the first couple of years. And just lucky we both got out of it. But I would love to, you know, had the mindset I have now back then. Yeah. And, but, you know, kids don't think about anywhere near as much as you do as you get older. And to me, it was just kind of cool, but it's something that I never really thought about. It just, I just thought it was kind of cool that he knew what it seemed to me. He knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. It just kind of, I do. I did realize and notice that up in the sky, the, you know, like birds, mm -hmm. there's something special about birds to him up in the sky, something special about something that can fly. Right. I don't know if, if that, you, if you can understand the correlation there, but it's uh, something I always thought 
might have been related, but you know. Well, and Karen says been, that too. She says they have some kind of reverence for anything with wings is like associated with Heavenly Father, according to her and what they're. Oh, uh, cool. So. No. Now that's cool. See that what I noticed and realized with Gleg, she that's kind of cool. See, I didn't know that. I need to go back and listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now here's another one that's going to come up, and this gets talked about regularly with the peculiar eyes that they have. I'm sure that around him, and you know, being out there with campfires going at night and stuff, you saw the reflectivity, the eye shine. Did you ever see any actual examples of eye glow? No. No. Okay. I saw his eyes shine bright, though, mm-hmm. especially when he'd get close because, you know, most people don't have a buddy that's sitting right next to the fire with you. Mm-hmm. And, but, and the shine that he'd get when he was close, I mean, but no, I never actually saw it glow. Like I said on a couple other things before, it's, not saying that they don't. It's just I never saw it. Right. Well, it may never have been necessary when you were around them. I mean, me yep. and uh, Rich were talking about that. And the working theory at this point is that the, the ones that spend a lot of time underground are the ones that have really developed that and need it. And it may ju- just be like a muscle in a human. If you work it, it gets bigger and stronger. And the ones that spend more of the time on surface don't need the eye glow. There's enough background yeah. light for them to see in the dark. But if they're going to be underground a lot, traversing big underground subterranean systems, then they would need to have it and they would have to develop it. So, And the the other interesting thing is that the people that seem to be, you know, reporting actual instances of eye glow, it's every time that I've heard it, it's Bigfoot that are in an area where there's car systems or lots of caves or something. Yeah. And the local tribes also say, you know, yeah, they spend a lot of their time underground. So there might be a direct correlation there, and it could be that Glag's uh, family just wasn't spending, you know, any time underground other than you know, yep. sleeping for a few hours in a cave or something and yep. didn't need to develop it. The only underground systems around there were, you know, old mines, but yeah. in the area, okay. in that area, there wasn't any. It was just like, you know, it wasn't a, a, a true cave. It was more, you know, opening and in the rocks and was able to get back in there away. Right. Not yeah. A, and not I, a I found some of those, uh, right. I found some of those over in Wisconsin where there were old crumbled, uh, rock hills, you know, a hundred, 150 feet tall. And there's a callous slope on it. And, you know, there's some pretty big openings in some of those piles of boulders that you can squeeze your way into. And there's, you know, they're caves essentially. Yep. Um, what's even weirder is one of them that I found. And I remember it was like a 98 degree day and I was walking, I was, clambering down the cliff. I climbed down the cliff. I was going down Talus Slope to slope uh, bottom of it, which is 70 or 80 feet high. And as I started getting down to the bottom of it, it started getting cooler. And I went, where's this cold coming from? This is like late July. And it's like 98 degrees. So I walked around the base of this pile and I realized what had happened is that during the winter months and, well, year-round, water was leaking into this big pile of rock. And during the winter, it would freeze solid. But it was on the south, uh, the north side of the hill, so even during the summer, it never got enough direct light for it to completely melt. And when the wind would come in the right direction down this hill, it would go through the talus slope, and it would blow cold air out the bottom of it. So you could sit down by the river, and it was like having a, a air conditioner on your back blowing nice. cold air on you. Yeah. So that became our favorite p- spot to take a rest during our big hike climb routine that we used to do there mm. where we'd go up and down about eight cliffs and try and do it in under an hour. And that was the spot at the end of the whole thing where we'd actually take a break and like drink a beer or whatever. Mm, nice. <laughs> but I remember going by there one time and uh, it wasn't a spot that I was normally in. It was way around the other side of it. And there was this funky smell coming out of there. And right away, you know, the alarm bells went off and I went, and I'm pretty sure I know what this is, and I'm getting the hell out of here. Yeah. And I really think there was one that would that it scores his way in there and was sleeping there during the day. And again, you know, nice cool spot during nice the summer. Cool spot. spot. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would not surprise me at all. Um, now, another question that we had about them, um, and this one I also find very, very interesting. You met them, like, in the late fall, and you said at that point, 
he was uh, like about six and a half feet, around like between four and five hundred pounds, maybe. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe a little less, but yeah, he was uh, just a little bit bigger than me height wise, but. Right. Man. Well, let's say three fifty, four fifty, six and a half feet, maybe. Yep. Okay, so one year later, after you've been feeding them, taking care of them, helping them, the following late part of the fall, how big was he by then? Huge. Um, uh, huge. Yeah, I kind of knew that, but let's ballpark uh, it a little bit more. <laughs> uh, you know, it was it was it like I told you, it seemed like every week that I went up there, he was bigger. He was yeah. probably at the end of the first year, probably right at seven and another two fifty. Good God. So you're estimating by the end of the first year he was between five, six hundred pounds and seven feet tall. Yeah. Right right around there. And it's a big boy. And you know, and the thing is is judging by how fast he put on all that weight and height really makes you kind of wonder about how old he was exactly. Yeah, because he had to be in the single digits to be as little as he was and still be growing that fast. I don't think he was 10 or older than that. I think he was more like 6, 7, 8, something like that. Oh, mercy. And, well, I, I had always thought he was older, but, you know, I never really knew for sure, but... right. The, the holy, holy crap. Well, close that, observations that means... from other people that have had long-term uh, interaction with them. Cat, for example, and she has a pretty clear idea on how fast they grow because she gets to watch them do it, and yeah. has on several occasions. And uh, she said the same thing. They're, you know, they're like human size basically. They're still toddlers. They're in their single digits still. Holy cat! So he was younger than I than I thought. Yeah, he was probably, probably. like half your age, basically. If if not less, even. And, and bigger than me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Holy cow. <laughs> well, and again, this makes sense. That's why if he had been closer to like 10, 12, you know, 13 years old, by then he might have been big and powerful enough and well-trained enough that he could have just been for himself and he wouldn't even need you. Okay. But he was, well, you know, he was at that stage where he could get around good. He could kind of take care of himself. He could hunt some things. He probably could. He probably knew how to gather a lot of stuff, but he wasn't quite big enough to go and you know try and tangle with some of the bigger animals, and maybe just didn't yeah. even really you know understand how to go about it, or he'd seen it done and didn't figure he was big enough to hack it or something for the most part. And you know, I mean, think of like a like a kid that's six, seven years old. He's got a slingshot. Well, he can probably take down a bunny rabbit, but he ain't gonna go deer hunting with it. You know what I'm saying? True. Man, that that. Considering how big they get and, you know, the, the apparent, let's just say that they average out around 9, 10 feet tall, and a human averages out around 5, 6 feet tall. So they're close to double our size. So when is a human 3 feet tall? How old are they? Yeah, true. Yeah, so yeah, if, they're, I, I, yeah. if they're growing yearly at the same rate as we are, in other words, going from 1 to adult by the time you're 19 or 20, would mean that when he was human size, he's going to be like – you know, the same age as a human that's like three feet tall when they're that size. So you know what that means? Holy cow. I, I made uh, tougher than all get out. <laughs> yeah, how well, it, it was good that you taught him how to defend himself, although he probably didn't have enough common sense to <laughs> yeah. maybe regulate what he was doing with it until he got to be a little bit older. Uh, you know, hopefully that didn't cause any major problems along the line anywhere, but at least not ones you're aware of. <laughs> yeah. No. Nope. Like I said, well, I always wanted him to be able to get back into his society, if you could call it that. And that's what I always hoped. But yeah, I didn't want him to, you know, look at what was going on with me. I didn't want him to ever go through what I was going through. I wanted him to be able to take care of himself no matter what come along. That must have been really tough for you, too, because even if you did your – uh, you know, for those of us that are older, uh, I'm just going to use the reference, born free thing with them. And, uh, you know, get them to go back to being out in the wild again and maybe being accepted by a, another Bigfoot troop or something. You know, how do you know that he's going to get accepted by a good troop? He could be stuck in the same kind of situation you were in with your family where some troop takes him in. They only like halfway put up with them. The, you know, the old ones that are older than him but not – like the alpha or something, pick on them when the other ones aren't around or, you know, you just don't. And that kind of stuff would be running through my head. 
It's like, with all the trouble of actually helping this poor little guy find himself another troop to live with, how can I assure that it's not going to turn into a total crapshoot like it is with, you know, my home situation? Yeah, and that's that's the reason why I wanted to teach him to be the toughest SOB in the Valley. So any of them that might, like, try picking on him would find that that was a bad idea. Right on. And lastly, I know this is one thing that you and me already mentioned, but a couple of people brought it up in the questions, and that was about, you know, did you get pictures of Glag? <clears throat> Let me feel part of that. You're about the same age as me. You're a little bit younger. Back then, there wasn't any electronic anything except for a stereo, okay? There weren't any electronic phones or video cameras or any of that stuff. You couldn't buy it. If you wanted a regular camera that you had to put film in, you could get that. There weren't even disposable cameras yet. And kids like me and Kevin that spent a lot of time running around the woods really weren't carrying cameras taking pictures. That was kind of a different mindset than what we were into. And, you know, kids have MP3 players the size of a postage stamp that carries 10,000 songs. For me to carry music with me, it required a Walkman that the rich kids had, not as poor poor kids, that was big and bulky and on a motorcycle. No. No, no, I didn't. I didn't have my first Walkman that played a cassette tape, which most kids don't even have any idea what a cassette tape is. Yeah, and that came out after you were already you had parted ways with Glag. So yes, there you go, guys. That tech just wasn't there at the time, and it was the same thing when I was, you know, having my experiences, uh, my first early ones in the seventies. <laughs> you know, we had a uh, uh, eight millimeter video camera that we could film with, and we had, like, one of the old-fashioned Polaroids, and that was it for the whole family. That's all we had. And, you know, when we went out hunting and stuff, we didn't carry cameras with us. That wasn't important. Nope. If we killed some really big animal that we wanted to get a picture of it or something, we could always take a picture afterwards. You didn't yeah, have to have a at, camera with you to do that. It when you're back in the house and, and your animal is in the back of the truck, that's when you take a picture of it. Yeah, or when you got it hanging, you know, out in the... The yard looking yep. all impressive and stuff. That's when you take your picture, standing next to it. See, here's how big it is. Yep. Um, so, you know, so just for for practical purposes, for those that are too young to to have been around for that, um, that sort of thing just wasn't done unless you were like some sort of a team that was doing, uh, you know, like research on wild animals for National Geographic or something. In general, you were not carrying cameras and stuff around with you when you were in the woods. That was something that, you know, photographers and people like that did, but it wasn't common for just yeah. ev- Joe, everybody, to be carrying a camera around with them. It and didn't it, happen, the, especially in a good, a good camera at the time, you know, there weren't the smaller little, you know, even the 35-millimeter film cameras, they were a big, bulky thing back then. It wasn't yeah. until the 90s that they started getting to where they were able to fit, like, in a shirt pocket. Those, oh, yeah. It, it wasn't, yeah, well, as you far know. as that goes, you know, we don't even have to go back that far. The first video camera that I got that you could, you know, they used videotapes looked like a TV camera. You had to put it on your shoulder, and the thing was $1,600. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah it had you great had great sound and great video quality, but, I mean, you know, my God, who has one of those lying around? Who's going to lug that yeah. through the woods with them? Yeah, who's going to carry uh, something that weighs 60 pounds and costs $2,000 that – and, and going to carry it on your back in a, on a dirt bike? N- no. No. And just no. Di- different era. It, yeah, at that point, that technology didn't even exist. That wasn't until, yeah. like, the uh, 90s. <laughs> yep. Late 80s or into the 90s. Before yeah. that, it didn't even exist, so it wasn't even yeah. an option. They they had 8-millimeter uh, cameras, but they were like, you know, the stuff that they use to film movies with nowadays. You know, it was a smaller version of that, but it it was like a, you know, a real to real camera. That, yeah, it just, yeah, that was the eight millimeter that we had. It yep. literally had the little reels on it that you'd have to play it yep. back on, and just like the PG film, you had to be super careful to not expose it when you're putting it in and taking it out again, or you'd ruin it. And 
You know, it just mm-hmm. wasn't anything like what we've got to deal with now. It was super iffy, touchy. And, you know, again, hats off to the PG guys. <laughs> got to give uh, Roger credit for that, for not screwing up the film and actually, you know, getting uh, yep. a good quality recording of it, even though it was shaky and wobbly and he was running and falling all well, over the place. Well, they didn't the have image stabilization and digital nope. anything to do. No, nope. actually and image the stabilization. For, for what he had, the technology that they had, that film is amazing. Well, yeah. For, now for the, the technology of the day. Yeah. And now the and what had. version where they actually gave good old Bill Munn the opportunity to go in there, take the original film and photograph it frame by frame and stabilize it and go through the whole thing. And the, the version that they've got out now, folks, that Bill Munn did – is a billion times better than the original version. That original one, when it was playing in the theaters, you got to see a few seconds of Patty Stabilize walking along, and the rest of it was all Bruh! camera jumping all over the place, frame jumping all over the place, couldn't yeah, make out anything. See, the, he has it recorded when he fell. Yeah, I can he just about smashed that camera on the rocks when he fell. Well, considering he got thrown off his horse right when the they came around the corner, mm, yep. he's lucky he even pulled the camera out and got any footage. It's amazing. Yep. Well, I think we covered all the viewer questions and stuff, so uh, we'll thank you all for tuning in and listening and kind of put this one to bed, and uh, we'll be back with Episode 4. Any any more questions, leave them in the comments, and we can do this again after another episode. Yep, anything that comes to mind that we haven't already answered, and we won't, and I'm sure we'll probably answer in upcoming episodes, but don't guarantee that that's going to happen, because we could always forget something, and... I could forget to ask him, or he could forget that it's important and mention it. <laughs> so yeah. anything that comes to mind that you guys want to know about, go ahead and ask the question. You know, He doesn't know everything, but he can tell you what he observed from watching Glag for five years. I'll tell you anything, any questions you got that I can answer. Yeah, again, thanks a lot for coming on the show again, man. I'm sure everybody's going to just love hearing about the second uh, part of the Glag saga. And I'm no. looking forward to having you come back to Tell us the, the whole rest of the story and get all that out here, and hopefully we'll be able to get that polished off before Christmas time at least. Mm-hmm. You still got to tell me about the crabby sasquatches over on the other side of the valley too. That's a whole other oh, can of worms that we got to talk well, about. Well, that that can be an episode of by itself, is because you know that was there was quite a few trips up there that we were taking. That, you know, after I figured out they were there, I took mm-hmm. buddies up there and. You know, made sure you don't stop and you just hammer down. But when they hear us coming, you're going to start getting that big rock rain coming after you. Oh, my God. Seriously, they're that bad? As soon as yeah. they start hearing the noise coming, they start raining the boulders at you. Yep. They 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 did not like the sound of them big, huge two strokes ripping down through oh, the valley. Oh, man. Oh, God. You guys are so lucky. And I just, I, like I said, fumbling my way through it. You know oh, how Jesus. could not, you know how lucky we were that yeah. there wasn't That's one of us that plugged off of there? They, if must you have went tried down, hard. they must have started thinking it was a game after a while. Oh, oh, look, they're coming by so we can throw some boulders toward them again. Well, I, I wasn't, I never took it as a game, and I. <laughs> Fifth gear hammered down through that mountain road, down through that area. And just, well, think about that first one you saw that was chasing that elk, how he flicked that boulder. Yeah, I know. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> yeah, well, you should have been before you were up there playing, let's go run through enemy territory and see if we get hit by a boulder on your friggin' motorcycle, dude. <laughs> see, that's the thing is I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about... Scaring the crap out of my friends that, or the people that you went with is all I was wanting to do is make them have a brown stain on their motorcycle seat. <laughs> Didn't they ever wonder where these boulders were coming from when this is happening? Well, I, they more times than I can count, it was yeah, who's hiding up there in the trees throwing rocks at us. <laughs> like you idiot! I told you. There's a bunch of Bigfoot up there that don't like the sound of your motorcycle, and they're chucking rocks at us, and you don't want to stop. And they want, you know, they wanted yeah, to go stopped, back. Yeah, you stopped, they'll hit you for sure. And, yep, they wanted to go back and kick the ass of whoever's throwing rocks oh, at us. It's like, 
you're stupid. That's exactly what I told you it is. Well, you know, open the eyes of more than one stupid idiot, and then the the, the guys that are still in denial about it because they're not real. No. Well, then what just rained rocks down on us as we were ripping through there? Uh, boulder grizzlies. They yep. throw rocks at you. <laughs> yeah. They throw boulders at you. Boulder grizzlies. That's what did it. Yep. BGs. <laughs> yeah, I know. I... Same thing when I was, Sonny was telling me about having a log thrown at her. Oh, and it hit me in the shoulder, too. Yeah. yeah it hurt her really good, too. She didn't want to talk about it. No, and that wasn't enough of a hint to make you go away. You wanted to come back again the next day. Good God. Well, I I was saying when I commented about her before the show started, and I was taking people up doing the same exact thing, just on a motorcycle yeah. with rock. Let's go play chicken with the, the crabby Sasquatch over here. No, let's not do that. Kids are crazy. All right. Well, All right. we're going to go here before everybody gets so freaked out that they can't sleep. And uh, <laughs> thanks again for coming on the show, and we'll have you on again soon.